in Kabecha. So today I'll be your host and I am very, very excited for both you and I because I know for certain that we are both going to learn a lot from each other, actually. Um, again, thank you so much for joining us. I know that it's Saturday and you would want to be sleeping in, but you have made a good decision, I think. And now that you have, you'll be learning more than um, what you could have if you just have stayed in bed. Um, but just for some few house rules, I know that some of you have used Zoom before and some might not have. So what we can do is we can practice some few things. At the bottom of your screen, um, there is some reactions that you can use to participate and to communicate with us. Um, and also you can use um, the bottom of your screen to mute your mic or to unmute or to maybe put on your video if your network allows. I know that some of us, um, we are in a very rural areas like me. So our networks isn't that great. So if we could maybe um, keep our videos off, that will help with network. Um, and also if you have a question, which I encourage you to ask, you can use the chat box to ask your question, or you can just raise your hands using the reaction um, at the bottom of your screen to raise your hand and I'll ask you to unmute and you can ask your question. I know that some of you um, we have met before and I know that you can attest that this is a very safe place. Please ask questions. We want you to ask questions. I'm asking you to please ask all the speakers questions. If there's something you don't understand, if there's something you want to know, it is okay. Um, I know that cool people don't say that cool, but we are very cool people. So we want you to ask questions. Um, and also please pay attention, literally pay attention because at the end, who knows, you might win something really, really cool now um, that you can show off to your friends. And not only that, most importantly, you can use it um, to you know, research for your school, um, activities and that you can better your um, career as a high school learner. So before we waste any more time, um, we have someone also very cool, I think, but he is a note manager at Sion Jovu Note. What he does is that he's a researcher and he's involved in many, many, many long-term environmental research projects. Um, his interest includes how riparian areas in savanna ecosystems um, are affected by climate change, the impacts of elephants on savanna trees, communities, and basically how um, we can restore grass dominated ecosystems. What he'll be doing with us today um, is introducing us to biodiversity and how climate change will affect it through some very, very nice activities. Um, so please, please participate. And again, ask him lots of questions because that is the only way you'll get to learn more. Um, so please um, welcome Dr. Tony Swema. Thank you so much and over to you. Hi, morning. Thanks, Subatile. Morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us this morning. Uh, I hope you guys can all hear me and see me okay. Okay, I'm going to share my screen now to start the presentation. Okay, is that showing up? Um, Caitlin, can you see that okay? Yes. All right, thanks. Okay, so... This, uh, this morning is a presentation about um, how the world is changing and how it's affecting biodiversity. And then we're gonna do a, an activity around that as well. So <laughs> planet Earth is a big place. It's a big picture, um, lots of different things going on. But if you look at it from space, like in this photo, a lot of what's going on is weather, all these clouds. Um, 
bring in rain or heat or cold to different parts of the world. And as you know, with global climate change, our weather patterns are now starting to change and that's gonna have big consequences, not only for us, but for all the other creatures that we share the planet with. So about a hundred, a couple of hundred thousand years ago, sounds like a long time, but in the history of the earth, that's not long at all. That's just a, a blink. Um, the earth was very different then. It was just wild animals and wild places. Um, some of these creatures we still see today in Africa, elephants and rhino. Um, and of course, in other parts of the world where we don't have them now, in Europe and North America and other places, there were similar animals. Up till around 10 or 20,000 years ago, there were woolly rhinoceros in Russia and Europe and giant elk and mammoths, basically hairy elephants that roamed around all parts of the world. Um, all different types of species of those. There was a type of lion that you can see in the bottom corner here um, that used to live in Europe and parts of, of Asia. Another picture of the lion. There were the saber toothed cats, which were similar to lions, but bigger with bigger teeth, feeding on all these animals. Things that looked like that. Even uh, giant hyenas, much bigger than the ones that we get now, which were quite common through America. But now the world is different. Um, most of these places look like this, or like that, or especially like this uh, agriculture towns, cities, um, taken over most of the world as human beings have risen um, and dominated most of these landscapes. And a lot of the wild areas are now being cleared um, for agriculture or other uses. And then on top of that, we have this thing called um, global climate change. And I'm sure you've heard about this before. Um, so I'm not going to go into details here. There's also Plenty of resources on the, on the internet, for example, that website that can explain what global climate change is very clearly. I actually wanted to do a quick um, poll about this. Um, Corgi, are you with us yet? Uh, yes, Tony, I've been here. Um, yeah, uh, sure. Thanks. I think we'll do, do you want to start with the type of device poll first? Oh, yes, thanks. Um, let's do that poll quickly. So, guys, we're just going to do a Zoom poll. Um, so Kogi is going to put a question up on your screens and then you just quickly answer and then we'll just see. So the first question actually I was meant to do in the beginning is just I wanted to know what device you're using for today. Are you watching this on a cell phone or on a laptop or PC? I'll just give a minute there for... Okay. All right, thanks. Let me just share those results. So the majority of you are on cell phones. It looks like we've got 84% on cell phones and just a few people using laptops or PCs. Okay, so it might be a bit difficult um, on your screens to see the slides and the details, but you can always um, just ask me to stop or ask a question if you want me to slow down, if you can't see so well. Okay, um, and then let's just do the second question quick. That was about climate change. Um, Kogi, can you put the second one on, please? Sure. Okay, so where have you learned about global climate change? Um, if you have. Okay. All right, so they're the results of that. So most of you here have learned about it at school, it seems. Um, and probably many of you from multiple sources so at school and then you've heard about it on the news or, or as part of a lesson. Okay, so let's not spend too much time on what global climate change is. You probably have a good idea about it. 
and you know that's happening. And these days, if you do follow the news, you hear about it all the time. There's just more and more events that are happening because of global climate change. You might hear about hurricanes or floods in Europe or heat waves or more fires. Okay, thanks, Corgi. Um, so all these changes are happening. And for all the species on Earth, including humans, you have to adapt to these changes. As the environment changes, as your world changes, if you can't keep up with those changes, then you're not going to survive. Um, it's, scientists are now predicting that about half of all living species on the planet are going to go extinct because of these changes over the next 100 years or so, which is a huge, huge number. So the question I have today is which ones are going to survive? Which ones are going to be able to survive in the new world? So before we get into that, let's look at how animals are adapted to their current environment. Um, obviously, through the process of evolution, animals have changed, plants and animals have changed over long time periods, over millions of years to become adapted and suited to the world that they're living, to their particular, particular habitats. Um, there's actually a good uh, example of evolution happening right now um, with Corona. But before I get into that, let's just do our third poll. Kogi, will you please put up the third question? And that's about evolution. I just want to see what your understanding of evolution is. Okay, there's your question. What is evolution? If you, and you guys on your phones, you might not be able to read the whole question there. Just let me know if you need help with that. I mean, with all those answers. Okay, we're nearly there. Just a few more answers coming in. Um, I see a question there from Aman Party. Uh, go ahead, Aman. Just unmute yourself. Uh, good morning, sir. Morning. Uh, good morning, sir. I wanted to ask, um, as we're talking about evolution, um, long time back, like millions of years ago, um, there were dinosaurs. So they were they were very active, they were aggressive, they were moving all around, and then they got extinct. But um, the uh, tortoise, who also were there during that time, they used they were very slow and they did nothing, but they they are still here today. So that means if the world does nothing, will it will they live longer? Or if they have become lethargic, will it will this world live longer through the species? Uh, no, I don't think so. Um, you'd have to look at the reasons why the tortoises survived and the dinosaurs went extinct. Um, and it's not necessarily because they were slow. I think it's more about their size and their diet. Uh, so the, the main uh, explanation or the current explanation for whether, why the dinosaurs went extinct is that really their food disappeared. So they were obviously consuming a huge amount of plants, the herbivorous dinosaurs. And then obviously the carnivorous dinosaurs were eating those herbivorous dinosaurs. So when there was a meteor strike that struck the earth and changed the climate so rapidly, a lot of the plants they depended on would have died out. And so they would have just starved to death. Um, whereas tortoises would have required much less food. So they would have been able to get by on the small amounts that were left over. 
there might have also been the effects of temperature. So the temperature requirements of large animals are different to small ones like tortoises. Um, and so that would have probably been helpful to them as well. And then lastly, um, the metabolism, they could, many species can't um, slow down their metabolism the way a tortoise can, um, which is not actually why it moves slowly, that's a separate thing, but it can just kind of shut down its body and wait until there's more food. Um, so it's complicated, but um, yeah, it's, there were so many species around and, uh, you know, Tortoises weren't the only ones that survived those big extinction events. There were others with different adaptations, different bodies. So um, it's complicated. Okay, thanks. I, I saw, I, did it, was there another hand somewhere? Yes, saw, it was Vinaya. Oh uh, yes, go ahead, Vinaya. Um. So, uh, I heard, I've seen an article where it was saying that humans' uh, thumbs are becoming like longer, supposed to like using the phones and things often. So is that true? Like, is that part of evolution and adaptation? Okay. Um, so no, um, but let me explain why. And before I do, let's just look at the answers you guys gave. Um, to the poll there. So the correct answer was B. So well done, the majority of you got it correct. Um, so evolution is basically when a species starts to change in some way um, as a result of certain individuals surviving better than others in a population of species. Um, a lot of you chose C, which is not quite right because it's not about, it's, it's almost, Right, but it's not about an individual changing the way it lives and then changing the characteristics of that species. There's a bit of a trick question there by me, but um, the reason C is not right, is not exactly right, is that it's because um, the changes only occur if when an individual's changed, that change happens also in its offspring, in its children and grandchildren, and they survive better than others. So let's get back to the question of the thumb. So we're using our thumbs a lot more. So maybe it's an advantage to have long thumbs if you're a human being in these days. Um, maybe because you can type better or something. So that might be an advantage in your every day to day life. Maybe it makes your life easier having long thumbs. But that doesn't mean that evolution is happening. Evolution would only happen if people with long thumbs had more children than people with short thumbs. Then over time, uh, you know, the, the people with long thumbs, their children would have long thumbs too if they inherited it from their father and mother. And then they would do better in life and they would have more kids. And then people with short thumbs wouldn't do so well. They would have less, less kids. And eventually, most of the world's population would have longer thumbs. So that's how evolution would work. It would take many generations. It would take hundreds of years. Um, and it's not happening. Um, Maybe it will in the future if there's for some reason people who can type better with long thumbs have more kids, survive better, then yeah, it'll happen. But at the moment, it's not happening. So that's often confusing with evolution. People think that if you change something in your lifetime that makes you better suited to your environment, then you've evolved. But actually, you haven't. It's only when it gets passed on to your children and their children and the whole population the characteristics of the whole population start to change. Um, so here's another example I mentioned um, that's happening with corona. <laughs> the coronavirus is obviously a major impact on our world and the coronavirus is in, evolving right in front of our eyes very rapidly uh, with major consequences for us. So how does that happen? Well, because the coronavirus is a small thing that reproduces so quickly, you can have lots of generations of it just in a short space of time. In a few months, a virus can reproduce itself hundreds of times. And so evolution can happen very fast. This also happens with other things, other germs, bacteria, and, and other diseases. But you've probably heard in the news about the different variants of coronavirus. So 
if you look at the top of this picture I'm showing you, let me just see if I can get a pointer. Oh, I can't. Um, but in the top there, we've got a whole lot of circles of different colors. So imagine those are all coronaviruses, individual little viruses, um, but there's different variants. So some are slightly different to others. And let's say the darker red ones reproduce a bit better than the others. So we've heard of the, de the Delta variant, the Delta coronavirus variant. It's much better at getting into the human body and getting into our cells than the other variants. So it's different types of, our, of coronaviruses. So let's pretend those red dots are the Delta ones. Um, so over time, they infect more people, they reproduce more, they spread more than the other variants. And eventually they take over completely. So we've seen the coronavirus evolve from the very first variant that came out um, just over a year ago to these other variants. And now the Delta variant is the most common type of coronavirus. So it's a slight change, but that's uh, evolution right before our eyes. Now, obviously with bigger animals that only reproduce, let's say after 20 years or 10 or 20 years, this process takes much longer. Um, and it's much slower, but in principle, it's the same thing. Okay, so um, just some terminology. When, when I'm saying that, that Delta strain, the Delta variant of the coronavirus does better, it's because it has adaptations. There's something about it. It's got to do with the chemistry on the surface of it, but there's something about it that allows it to get inside human cells better than other strains of and the variants of coronavirus. So it's got some sort of adaptation. And I'm going to get to speak about that more now. But before I move on, are there any other questions about evolution? All right, so let's move on. Okay, so over millions and millions and actually billions of years, We've had different plants and animals slowly changing as the environment changed, or sometimes even when the environment doesn't change, um, they through competing with each other or something, there's reasons for some of them to survive and others not. And so we have this process of evolution happening and it has led to a, just an amazing diversity of plants and animals and other living things on the planet. Uh, literally billions scientists we haven't counted up all the species that exist but it's estimated to be billions like over one billion species and they're all kinds of things as you know i mean from the huge things elephants and whales down to tiny insects down to little microbes and viruses that live in the soil and all adapted in different ways for their particular environment so um, let's just think of some local examples um, dealing with heat. So South Africa is a hot place. Uh, most of the country gets very hot as, as does most parts of Africa and many parts of the world. And so if you're going to live and survive in these environments, you have to have adaptations to survive heat or too much heat. Um, mammals, for example, being warm blooded, we have to keep our internal temperatures around 37 degrees. Um, that varies a bit for species, but more or less. And if it gets hotter than that, then the proteins in our bodies get messed up and our brains can't really function properly. Um, so we have to avoid getting too hot. There's a simple adaptation for that, which is called a behavioral adaptation. It's simply to find shade, to stand in the shade like these elephants are doing. And of course, human beings do that all the time. We go to great lengths to make shade by building houses or you know, other things. Um, if you can't find shade, you can also go underground. So many animals just simply dig into the ground to avoid too much heat. Um, these you might recognize, these are called meerkat. So they live in the Kalahari Desert, the semi-desert up in the, the Northern Cape area and further up into Botswana, Namibia. And it's a very hot place and there's not many trees. It's hard to find shade. Um, so they dig these burrows and they have these really massive underground homes where they spend a lot of the day. Of course, many insects do that as well. A large amount of insects live underground, at least for, for during the day or some part of their life. Um, termite mounds, which are also called anthills, although technically they're not ants, they're termites. Um, these little creatures you can see in the bottom left of the screen there. So they really got quite sophisticated in doing this. They don't just live underground. 
They live underground and they build a network of ventilation. So within their termite mounds, they dig a whole lot of tunnels, like you can see in that picture at the right, and that causes airflow through their homes. So it drives um, a flow of air through their homes, which helps to keep it even cooler. So they're a bit more sophisticated in, in avoiding excess heat. Uh, if you can't get into the ground, you could also get into the water if there's water nearby. Um, so that's not a very common adaptation, but of course we have the hippopotamus around in South Africa and Africa. Um, and that's what it does. It spends most of the day underwater because it's just cooler. Sometimes you can make your own shade if there's none shade around. So this is the Cape ground squirrel, which also lives in the Kalahari. And it's got this massive tail as, a, as a, its adaptation. Um, and it uses it basically as an umbrella. When it's searching for food in the day, it keeps it in a position like that, as you can see, and that's shading it. It also serves to keep it warm, so it's got two purposes, that particular adaptation. Okay, um, another way to avoid getting too hot is to reflect the heat off your body if you can't find shade. So this is the springback. Um, also lives in places where there really isn't much shade in the Karoo and in dry areas like that where there are hardly any trees. So it's got very shiny fur that reflects a lot of heat off it. And actually, in this case, um, it, has to it has to deal with heat bouncing off the ground as well. So in these very open areas, you get a lot of heat bouncing off the bare soil and back onto your body. So it's got the white coloring. And I'm sure as you guys know, white and light colors reflect heat better than dark colors. So that white underneath is reflecting a lot of that heat away that's bouncing off the soil. Um, and also dealing with heat on the ground, the heat um, in deserts, you know, the heat not only comes to the air, but it's heating up that soil. That soil can get to like 50 degrees easily on an average day. And so then it comes into your body directly from contacting the soil. So here's an example of a species of lizard um, that lifts its feet. You can see how it's lifting its toes off. So it's got a behavioral adaptation where it, it keeps on lifting its feet and toes up all the time. So they're not in contact with the hot soil too much. And then they cool off briefly in the air. All right. Um, another strategy is if you can't avoid getting hot, you can at least try and get rid of the heat that your body has absorbed. Um, so there's a lot of animals that live in desert environments where there's no shade and they get hot, but then they're able to transport a lot of that heat through the blood and out of their ears. Um, ears are pretty good for getting rid of heat because they got a big surface area. They thin and they got a lot of area that heat can move out of. So a lot of things that live in deserts have very big ears. Um, there's an example of a fox, of a, a rabbit, even of a little mouse, it's actually a gerbil. And you can see the skin is very thin in those ears and there's a lot of blood vessels going there. So a lot of the heat that's generated in the body and that's absorbed by the body then moves up to the ears and air flows over those ears and the heat moves out of the blood through the thin skin and out. Another animal that does this that you may be more familiar with is the elephant. Also very big ears, it really doesn't need ears of that size for hearing. Those big flaps, flappy ears are not there to help its hearing, they're there to get rid of heat. Um, and if you look closely at that picture on the left, you might not be able to see it on your screens, but you can see the veins. I mean, they're massive because it's an elephant. But um, towards the edges of the ears, you can see the network of veins coming out there. Um, and those elephants often flap their ears when it's very hot and it just gets a nice flow of air over the ears and that helps to cool it down. If you look at the picture on the bottom right there, that's a special photo taken with a thermal camera. So that's a camera that's detecting heat. And it's, it's just showing that there's a lot of heat around the elephant's body. But if you look at those ears, they light blue, that shows they're a lot cooler. So that's just because that heat is flowing out of those ears. Um, and that's a really important cooling mechanism. Of course, elephants are a bit more sophisticated. They also have other ways to cool themselves. They can move to the shade, which they do during midday. And they spray themselves with muddy water so that there's a layer of mud on them, which helps to reflect heat. 
Um, and of course, they can just spray them. It's getting really hot. Okay, and then one of the more unusual ways, um, but very effective, is to use the power of evaporation or evaporative cooling. Um, so I don't know if you've ever noticed, but if it's a cold day and you wet, you get extra cold. Or if you've been swimming and you get out the swimming pool and you're still wet, you feel your body cool down. And that's just because I'm sure you would have learned by now in physics that when water evaporates, that requires energy and that water takes energy from its environment so that it can evaporate. And so, um, for example, the dog there, he's, he's sticking out his tongue because it's a hot day and that tongue is full of dog slobber, basically water. Um, and that water evaporates off the tongue and it cools down and then it cools down the blood inside the dog's tongue and then that cools down the whole body. So it's a way of cooling yourself by letting water in your body evaporate. And humans are kind of the specialists at this. Uh, throughout the animal kingdom, no one really uses evaporative cooling as much as we do. And you know that as sweat. That's why we sweat so much. It's a way to get water to evaporate off our bodies and cool us down. And humans are actually really good at dealing with heat. Um, we can function during midday. Very um, we can spend time, we can even run, which is a very hot activity uh, in the middle of the day when it's hot, when other animals can't. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard the story of the San, the Khoi San, being able to hunt kudu in the middle of the day simply by running them to death. They would chase after antelope in the heat of the day and like a kudu, for example. And because the kudu can't deal with heat as well, they would soon overheat and they become exhausted and they can't keep running. Um, whereas the hunter could keep running for hours through the day simply by having enough water and by sweating continuously. And so they were able to literally just run the animals down. Okay, so with global climate change, we know there's global warming. So animals are adapted to heat, but how much heat can they handle? And those without these sort of adaptations are going to struggle the most. Um, oh, sorry, one last adaptation for heat. Um, and this is quite a complicated one. It's probably the most sophisticated one. So these animals are called Chemsbok. They also occur in the Kalahari Desert and further up through the deserts of, of Africa. And they've decided, well, they didn't decide, but the way that they evolved was to just really protect the brain from excess heat and allow the rest of the body to get hot. So the brains are the most sensitive parts of the mammal body to heat of any animal. Um, if your brains get too hot, they start consuming, they, they start functioning too fast, they consume too much oxygen, and then they run out of oxygen, and then you die. Um, so the, the Hemsbok protects its brain from getting too hot, even though the rest of the body is getting really hot. And it does that with a special network of blood vessels that go around its air pipe. So as it breathes in, um, there's, uh, there's like water and mucus on its, on its airways and that evaporates and that cools down. And so that cools down a network of blood and that blood gets cooled down just before it enters the brain. So they've got a special route for their blood to flow through before it enters their brain and that cools down the blood entering their brain and that keeps their brain cool. And that's why these animals can just live perfectly happily in these really hot environments. If it's like 35 to 40 degrees outside, they don't need shade, they're fine. They're just walking around like no problem. Whereas all the other animals are desperately seeking shade or underground at that time. Okay, so. Yeah. Another issue um, similar to heat is dryness. Um, so a lot of the parts of the world are very dry already or gonna become dry. And as you know, all life needs water. We all need water. Animals need to consume water, um, and plants and animals. Um, and a lot of animals have come up with some very clever ways to get enough water in very dry places. So for example, that little creature on the left there, it's a, a type of horned lizard. Um, it lives in deserts where it hardly ever rains, but there is mist, where mist comes in from the ocean. And it uses those little spikes on its body to collect mist. 
So in the early hours of the morning when there's mist, the water droplets will condense onto its body because, because it's all spiky. Condensation is going to occur on its body more than anywhere else. And so it gets a lot of little water droplets forming on it. And then those actually get absorbed. That water gets absorbed straight through the skin. So it doesn't have to find liquid water. It doesn't really need rain. It can just absorb water straight from the atmosphere through its body. Um, the beetle on the right there does a similar thing. So this is a little type of beetle called, called a tenebrioid. And it also uses its body by sticking its body up like that with the little bumps on it to promote condensation. So when mist comes in, little droplets are forming on its body. And then by standing at an angle like that, those little water droplets run down its body towards its mouth and it just drinks them. It just sucks up those little droplets as they fall. Um, the bird at the bottom there is called a sand grass and that uses, um, that doesn't use uh, mist or fog, it relies on water, surface water, but there's not much surface water around in the dry places where it lives. So when it finds a dam or something, it flies really far in search of water. And then it can soak up water from a puddle or a dam or a river um, using its feathers. It's got special feathers underneath its body and they soak up a lot of water and they hold that water and then it can use that to, um, it can basically transport that water back to its nest. Um, for its for its fledglings, for the young birds, and they can drink then from the feathers. So it's got a way of transporting water from where it is to where it's needed. Um, another way to deal with a lack of water in environments where you've got a wet season and a dry season, um, where you've got a long dry period, normally in the winter where it doesn't rain for a long time, and water is very scarce, you can deal with that simply by not being active at that time just by basically hibernating through the dry period. It's actually not called hibernation, it's called estivation, but it involves animals just burying themselves underground and waiting for the rains again. So in South Africa, we have a, a member of the frog family called the giant bullfrog, which is a, shown on the top left there. It's a huge thing, it's about 20 centimeters long, um, but that lives in areas where it only rains in summer, um, mostly the high felt and the low felt. So there used to be tons of them around the Joburg area and all those, those mussins. Um, and at the end of summer, they just bury themselves underground and whatever moisture they have in their body stays locked in because they're buried. And they just wait there for about six months for the summer. Um, the, the guy on the right there is another example of that. That's just a strange looking frog. It's called a purple frog. It was only recently discovered in India, um, but it does exactly the same thing also in environments where it's very dry in the winter. Uh, a lot of insects do this as well, um, but they're more complicated because they have these different cycles, these different phases of their life. So, for example, the Mopani worm, which is quite well known in South Africa, it spends the dry winters in the, in the phase of the cocoon. So at the end of summer, the, the worms bury themselves underground and they become the cocoon, they pupate. That's the bottom right picture there. And then they spend the dry winter in that sealed off cocoon where all the water inside their body will stay inside and they wait for rains before they emerge. So having a, a complicated life cycle where you can spend some of the year in a dormant phase, an inactive phase is a, is a very common adaptation to aridity. Um, I'm sure you've all heard of the camel, which are well known for surviving in deserts. Um, and when I was young, I always thought, we were always told that the camels store water in their humps as if it's like a water tank. And it's not actually true. No animals have like a water tank inside their body. Um, but they do store water in a slightly more complicated way. So they have fat tissue. Um, inside those humps is basically just fat. And that fat is a good store of water because when the body breaks down fat, water is released as a byproduct. So when they eat, um, there's a lot of water in the food they eat. They convert that food into fat and the, the water is still part of it. And then when they digest it later, they get a supply of water directly inside their body as that fat breaks down. Uh, they're also very good at recycling water in their bodies. So in their digestive tract, when the waste food is being processed, uh, their intestines will absorb a lot of water out of the, that waste food. 
um, before it comes out, before it comes out as dung. Um, so they, they hang on to whatever water they have. Another, a lot of animals also do that with their urine. Um, so this is a strange type of lizard from Australia. I think it's, yeah, it's Australia. It's called the Gila monster, but it's also very good at hanging on to whatever water it gets. Um, and so its urine is actually basically solid. They absorb so much water back out of their urine and just leave the waste products um, that it comes out basically in a dry form. Okay, guys, any questions so far? All right. Um, so global warming is obviously a hot topic, but it's, um, it's also bringing, strangely enough, a lot of cold weather. So in certain parts of the world, the winter storms are becoming more intense. And so a big part of climate change is actually that we have colder winters in certain areas. It might not be that the whole winter is colder, but you have more intense storms, winter storms, and so you have colder temperatures. So adaptations to dealing with cold are also important. Um, we're not so familiar with this in South Africa, South Africa because we don't have such cold places. Um, we do have a few, but not like the Northern Hemisphere where it's really cold in the Arctic areas. Um, so one way of dealing with real cold weather is just to get really hairy. And that creature you can see there is called a musk ox. Uh, it's similar to a cow or a buffalo, but it's just got really thick fur. Um, and that keeps it warm during the, the cold winters they have there where it's snowing basically the whole winter. Um, you can also see, you can't, you won't really see it so nicely on this picture, but remember I said big ears are a good way of dealing with getting rid of heat. So if you live in a cold place, you don't want to lose any heat. You want to hang on to any heat your body has. And so these guys have really small ears. So most of the animals from cold places, you'll notice, have small ears. Um, see there's some hands up. Let me just see if I can find who's got their hand up. Oh, okay. Aman, do you want to go ahead? Um, I wanted to ask, where are the musk oaks found? Um, the musk ox are in Canada, the northern parts of Canada and Alaska. Um, so it's, it's right near the Arctic Circle, um, those northern parts where it's really, really cold. There is a similar, I'm not sure actually if they're found in the northern parts of Europe, like Scandinavia, Norway, Sweden. I think there's a different species there. I'm not sure if it's the same species or not, but it's a very similar animal that you get there as well. Um, okay, we had another question. Who was it? Sir, um, I had a question, sir. Um, uh, yeah, uh, go ahead. Um, a bumblebee, that um, it actually flies, but as for signs, it has, it's a very small size, but it's heavyweight. And if we see science tells that it, it shouldn't fly, but still the animal, it hasn't evolved and it is flying still because, but it, it actually needs a bigger size and less weight in order to fly. And it didn't evolve. So it's going against evolution and it is still flying. Um, like, what is the science behind this? Like, can scientists really prove what is happening here? Uh, yeah, so most insects, or the, all the flying insects actually um, fly according to the same laws of physics. Um, so the evolution of insect wings is thought to have come about um, through basically their skin, their scales that um, first evolved to come to, you know, to stick out a bit to help with heat and dealing with excess heat. And then over time they got bigger and were able to be used for helping with movement and eventually flight. Um, so in evolution, it's very difficult to imagine how wings can evolve out of nothing. Like how do you go from something that doesn't fly into something that flies in one step? It's, it doesn't make sense. But there would have been intermediate steps where those appendages, those wings were actually not wings, they were used for something else and they slowly got bigger and bigger and eventually they helped in a little bit of flight, maybe just to helping an insect to jump a bit further and then a bit further and then its offspring would have had slightly bigger wings and they could have jumped a bit further and eventually that 
over millions of years that then becomes the ability to fly and proper wings. So in terms of saying that they shouldn't be able to fly, um, that's not really true. They don't fly according to the same scientific principles that um, aeroplanes use to fly or birds for that matter. So with larger animals like birds and with aeroplanes, A little bit differently and they actually almost swim through the air because they are so small and the wings on them that friction becomes more important and they can almost push against the air particles to make themselves fly and scientists have studied this quite extensively and they've looked at the way the wings move through the air and it's quite different to the way a bird flies the way the insect's wings move um, it's almost like they're pushing themselves through the air rather than gliding or propelling themselves forward through the air. So yeah, interesting. And um, a lot of people have questioned evolution, not just because of bumblebees, but for many other really sophisticated adaptations that we have. Um, so for example, the eye, I mean, the eye is a very complex thing. How did that evolve? But there are explanations of how it evolves over time through various stages which were not for sight at first and then slowly changed into being used for sight. Um, with Tomela, I see your hands up. Did you also have a question? Um, but Tomela, did you have a question? No. What was that asked? Okay. All right, let me move on then. Um, oh, okay, another example of animals dealing with the cold. So, you know, in South Africa, our antelope generally are short-haired. They have very shiny coats that are smooth and have short fur. But in the northern parts of the world, the similar species, this, for example, is an elk. They have these really thick coats. And they also have the ability to change the thickness of their coat through the seasons. So if you have pets at home, you might know that your dogs or cats shed their hair in summer, which is really annoying. Um, and then they grow thick hair again in the winter. So many animals do that. So these elk, you can see they've got their winter coat on. They've got really thick hair around the neck there, thick fur. Um, but they'll lose that in the summertime when they don't need to stay so warm. Okay. Another example of something with very thick fur. So that's the bobcat, which is a type of cat, a bit larger than the domestic cat, also lives in those Northern environments. And it looks fat, but it's not fat at all. It's just got really thick fur. Um, another way to deal with cold, in addition to having thick fur, is just to spend the winter, the cold winter um, indoors. So that's what bears do. Many species of bears, they hibernate, they basically just sleep. So, you know, in, in winter, guys, when you have to get up early and you wish you could just stay in bed for the whole day because it's warmer, well, they basically do that for the whole winter. Um, for five to seven months, they will stay inside a cave or a hole and sleep almost the entire time. And their bodies have special adaptations that allow them to just shut down, basically, and, and they hardly need any food. They won't eat or drink for the whole time. And then... When it warms up in summer, they go out and they eat a lot and they store up enough fat and that gets them through the next winter. Uh, some more raised hands. Who's that? Oh, okay. Uh, are you um, What cat was that? Oh, sorry, what, was the name? what was the name of that cat? Like, yes. Oh, the bobcat. <laughs> Bobcat yep. and the black. Yeah. What are these black animals right here? Uh, sorry, what are what is that animals? These animals that are right here right now. What are what is its name? Oh, the one on the screen now. That's the black bear. Okay, thank you. Oh, so that's the bear that lives in North America. 
Um, but most bear species um, hibernate like this one. Okay, and there's another question there from, is it Martha? Um, yeah, is the bobcat a domestic animal or wild animal? Oh, it's a wild animal. Um, okay. It's quite, I don't know if you've heard of the caracal or roy cut that lives in, in South Africa, um, which is also a wild animal, sort of similar size, um, related to the domestic cat, but it's a different species. The okay. bobcat is quite common through America and up into Canada and Alaska. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry, I had a question. Yes, go ahead. So uh, there's a fox that's found in Iran. It's called the Rupel's fox, I think. I, I'm not sure of the pronunciation, but mm -hmm. its way of adaptation is concentrated urine. So how does this help it with dealing with heat? Um, well, that's probably not for heat, it would be for water. Um, by concentrating urine, um, you get to reabsorb a lot of the water that's in your urine before it comes out of your body, but you absorb just the water, not the waste products. Um, so it's a very common adaptation in dry environments. Um, and that particular fox would be living in the deserts and semi-deserts of the Middle East, um, where there's hardly any surface water. In fact, a lot of the carnivores there, they get enough moisture out of their food. So like it kills a rabbit or a mouse or something, and that animal's got water in its body. And then when the fox digests it, it absorbs a lot of that water, and then it just makes sure that it doesn't lose it again through its, uh, through its urine. Oh, OK. Thank you. Um, just looking in the chat there, was there a question? OK, there was a bobcat. Why are the northern parts of the world colder than the southern parts? Okay, that's a good question there from, from life. Um, I'm sorry, can I answer that question, please? Okay. I think the northern part is cold because it's more situated at the polar and um, it's covered by oceans more than the southern part because it's only in South Africa and India that there's oceans and some part of African countries, they don't have oceans. So the Northern part is more colder because of the climate change towards the ocean. Mm. Um, yeah, that's a pretty good answer. Um, that is true. So if you look at the Southern part of the world, there's more ocean than the North, but that ocean itself um, would be just as cold as the oceans in the North. But it means where you do have land, um, the oceans tend to stop the land from getting too cold. They're like a buffer. So areas that are next to the ocean don't get as cold as land further away. And in the Northern Hemisphere, you've got big areas of land right far up north. So right around the Arctic Circle, you've got parts of Russia, you've got Northern Europe, you've got Northern Canada, Alaska. So a lot of land mass that's right up far north and not too much ocean around it. Whereas when you get right down to the South Pole, it's mostly ocean. Um, but of course, Antarctica, which is right down south and is a big land mass, that does get really cold. That gets just as cold as up north. And the animals that live in Antarctica are, are, have to adapt with the same, in the same sort of ways. Okay. Um, all right, let me move on. Oh, sorry, there's a question there. Do polar bears use their fur for the cold? Yes, definitely. Um, polar bears have really thick fur. So that's an important adaptation for them. It's interesting that they're white. Hey? I mean, you would think because white reflects heat and dark colors absorb heat, you would expect a polar bear to be black. Um, that would help it stay warmer. But of course, an animal can't only adapt to one part of its environment. You have to have adaptations to deal with all kinds of things. So the white in the polar bear is an adaptation to help it to hunt. Because it's a hunter, it needs camouflage, it lives in areas that are covered in snow and ice, um, and it hunts what it, basically whatever it can find. But the white is camouflage, it helps it to blend into its environment. 
So it's kind of sacrificed. It's using the thickness of the fur to deal with the cold, and then it's using the color to deal with camouflage rather than to deal with, with the, the cold. Um, uh, bear is a mammal, so they're warm-blooded. Yeah, that's correct. There's a question there in the chat from Abake. Yeah, bears are warm-blooded, and they must keep their internal temperature about as warm as we keep ours. Okay, let me move on. Now, where was I? We were talking about cold and bears. Um, another way of dealing with the cold, if you can't keep warm, you can just accept the cold and tolerate the cold. And so there are some interesting animals that do this. The one on the top left there is a type of frog um, that occurs also in these areas I'm talking about, right up um, in the Arctic areas in Canada and Alaska. And they basically just allow their bodies to freeze in the winter. They have special chemicals inside that enable their bodies to freeze without getting damaged. And so when winter comes, they just hop into a safe place, sit there, freeze, get really cold. And when it warms up in spring, their bodies kind of thaw out and they carry on with their life. Um, so there's really amazing chemistry involved in that. Um, and a lot of fish in the sea do that as well because they're animals like this, they don't have the option of keeping out the cold with fur or, or something else. Um, the picture in the bottom right there is an insect. Um, and that's a type of uh, wood beetle. And there's many species of insect like this that also just are able to freeze. So of course, this is not an option for warm blooded animals because the chemistry of our bodies, it just can't tolerate that. But in cold blooded animals, some of them can, become, can deal with such coldness. I see another question there. That's Martha. Go ahead. Um, last last time I had a last science um lesson when we were doing about gaseous exchange, I heard that frogs um they they have lungs for breathing, right? So mm. my teacher was saying that even their their skin can also help in respiration respiratory system. So you just say that. Um, they can make their their body like freeze. So won't this affect their breathing system as well? Because I hear that the skin can also adapt to breathing and stuff. Yeah, that's quite right. So frogs are quite bizarre because they live in water and on land. Um, and then when they're on land, they have to, their skin has to stay moist because they actually absorb oxygen directly through their skin. Many of them can do that, um, which helps them get enough oxygen so they don't only get it through their lungs. So wow, this is wrong. when they get cold, uh, their whole body is shutting down. They don't really need oxygen. Um, it's okay that their skin is not functioning that way anymore um, because they basically, everything just shuts down. Their, their tissues don't need oxygen to, to be active. Um, and then obviously once they thaw out again, that skin would start functioning that, that way again. Okay, another question there. Uh, who's that, Noki? Okay. Hi, yeah, it's Noki. Hi. What type of a frog is that? Uh, you mean the name of it? Yeah, the name. Oh, you know, I've actually forgotten. Um, uh, let me look that up. I'll post it in the chat a bit later. Okay, thank you. Okay. And another question there, Matomi. Oh, just un unmute yourself, Matomi. Um, like what happens if they get severely dehydrated during hibernation? Uh, sorry, you're gonna have to say that a bit louder. Like what happens if they get severely dehydrated during hibernation? Okay. Yeah, so that is that could be a problem because you're not drinking. Um, but when you're hibernating, remember it's very cold, so you're not going to lose water. Um, they won't really um, create any urine, so they shouldn't lose water through urine. They sh One place that you do keep losing water through is your lungs. Um, so they have to keep breathing, even though they're hibernating. And when you breathe, um, I don't know if you guys know, but the inside of your lungs has to be coated in a, in a thin layer of water or mucus, just like the frog skin. 
um, and that because that enables oxygen to move out of there and into your blood. So you're always going to have a problem of losing a little bit of water when you breathe. And if you like hibernating for five months, eventually that's going to add up. But um, as I mentioned with the camels, um, when you've stored up fat, so these bears and other animals will store up a lot of fat before they hibernate. And then that fat will slowly break down by, um, as they, as they, even though they're hibernating, they're still going to need a bit of energy. And that's going to create a bit of water as they digest that fat in, internally. And that's enough to, to get them by. Okay, that's a good question. Thanks. Another question there. We, who's that, Jonella? Yonela, uh, are you with us? Um, sorry, what is the name of this insect? Uh, the insect, it's a type of um, wood beetle. I also don't have the exact species name with me. I know there's quite a few of them. So I'll also, I'll look that up when you guys are doing your activity just now and I'll post it in the chat. Okay, okay. and um, Vivek, is there another question there? Hello, sir. I just wanted to ask, why can't hum humans hibernate? Is it because it's an evolutionary thing or something else? Yeah, so it's an evolutionary thing. In order to hibernate, your body needs a whole lot of adaptations. Um, it's to do with the chemistry. So um, we just, uh, I suppose because we got so clever, we never really needed to evolve that adaptation. So, you know, humans are, humans started out in Africa. We kind of evolved in Africa first and then, which is a, a warm place and then spread out into Europe and, and other parts of the world where it's colder. So you might've thought that humans then evolved the ability to hibernate in these other cold environments as they spread out. And if that had happened, we would have split into two species, one that can hibernate and one that can't. But that didn't happen, I think because we're so clever, when we got into explore these colder areas up north, we found other ways of dealing with the cold um, that are better than hibernation for us. And that is specifically that we, we developed the ability to use clothes. We hunted and we skinned the animals and we made clothes and we made fire as well. We, we, we developed the ability, the intelligence to master fire. And so as humans spread into really cold parts, they had technology tools, they had fire and warm clothes that kept them warm. And so we didn't really need to hibernate. Because you can imagine hibernation comes with a lot of costs. You know, it's, it works nicely, but it also brings a lot of risks. If there's predators around and they find you, they're going to catch you easily because you're asleep. Um, and there's the issue of being able to store up, your body needs to store up a lot of fat to get you through the winter. So I guess for humans, uh, we just found a better way before we evolved that ability. And now, I mean, it, would, it wouldn't really happen. It's just not necessary for us. Okay, um, thanks. Yonela, is that another question or is that your hand up from before? Uh, Yonela, are you there? Um, sorry, I think Yonela has um, an audio problem. So she typed her question on the chat. Oh, okay, thanks. Let me have a look at that quick. Uh, where are we? Um, sorry, I'm just struggling to get down these questions in the chat. Hi, Tony. Is this a vocal sac? That's what Yonela is asking. Sorry, is, is what? Is this a vocal sac? That is Yonela's question in the chat. Oh, a vocal sac. Is this a vocal sac? Um, she looking at the frog. So there is a vocal sac on that frog, but you can't really see it. Um, it's just, it would be just under the mouth. But all frogs do, almost all frog species do have a vocal sac. Um, but of course, that's, that's to do with making their calls, not with heat or cold. Okay. Um, let me move on. Okay. 
Cascades frog. Okay. Thanks, Vinaya. I saw you posted in the chat. Yeah, the, it is a Cascades frog. Um, it's one that can allow its body to get really cold. Okay. Um, see, there's still a hand up there. Vivek, is there another question there? Um, Vivek, are you there? Okay, wait, messages. All right, let me move on then, guys. But thanks for the questions. It's fun. Feel free to keep asking as we go along. Um, there's not too much longer left of my presentation, and then we'll do the activity. Okay, so I haven't really given much attention to the oceans. Um, obviously, a large amount of living species occur in our oceans rather than on land. Um, and in the oceans, you have to deal with cold as well. Um, and there's a large and amazing diversity of fish species and insects and other invertebrate species that live in really, really cold water. Uh, water that's basically at freezing point. In fact, because the oceans have salt in them, you know, ocean water is a bit salty, that salt lowers the freezing point. So ocean water can be as low as minus two while it's still liquid before it freezes. And there are a whole lot of creatures living in that water that gets down so cold. So one way of dealing with cold in the water is just to get really, really big. Um, the bigger you are, the less heat you lose because your the ratio of how much surface area, how much skin you have to how much body you have changes. That's a bit complicated, I won't get into it. Basically, the bigger you are, um, the less heat you're gonna lose. So some ocean animals like the whales are just insanely big. This is a blue whale here, the largest creature on earth, and it can live in really cold water as many of our, our whale species can. Another adaptation that this animal has is really thick skin. Um, so fur works well on land, but underwater, fur is not going to work so well because water gets into your fur and that just transports the heat away, so it doesn't insulate you. Um, but if you have a thick layer of fat under your skin, then that's a really good insulator that stops heat moving out of your body. Uh, and so a lot of ocean animals have a really thick skin, thick blubber. It's called blubber, the fat of ocean animals. Um, there's a whole lot of other adaptations that occur in fish and marine mammals um, involving the chemistry. So ways that the, the biochemistry in their body works that stops them from freezing in cold water. Um, and they've also got ad adaptations for dealing with salinity and um, getting oxygen out of the water. But I'm not going to get into that. It's just too much for today and it's quite complicated. And also it's quite difficult for you guys to use that sort of in your activity because it's mostly happening at the chemical level inside the body. It's more stuff you would learn about if you went to university. Okay, so for the rest of our session today, guys, we've got 30 minutes left. Um, I want you just to work in, in groups, break up into little groups and think about how the world is changing. You can choose some part of the world. And then I want you um, basically to play God. You can design your own animal, take an animal species and change it in a way that's going to make it better able to survive as its environment changes. So to design your own animal task, um, here are the steps to, to go through. So first of all, pick some part of the world um, that you're familiar with. So you could choose, say, the Kalahari Desert or the Bushveld, or if you live... Um, in a grass in some way, just pick an area that you know about. And then you can just think about how it's gonna change due to global climate change. This doesn't have to be exact. You can just um, give a guess. So you can say, okay, my part of the world is gonna become hotter or it's gonna become drier, or maybe there's gonna be more floods, uh, or maybe the winters are gonna become longer or shorter. Maybe it's gonna be a longer dry season the animals have to cope with. Maybe there's going to be more severe winter storms. So just pick three things um, and then pick an animal species that lives in that, in that part of the world. 
If you're not sure, you can choose an animal um, that lives in another part of the world that's a similar environment, if you like, just an animal species you're familiar with. So maybe you want to choose a frog or a springbuck or an elephant or whatever. And then think about how it would have to become better adapted to deal with the changes that are going to happen. So if you've said, okay, I'm picking this part of the world, it's going to get hotter and I'm picking this animal, then I want you to think about how you can modify that animal to help it deal with, with higher temperatures. Okay, so that's the ad ad adapting your species part. So come up with adaptations that will make it better, easier for your animal to survive. And then give your modified species, your new creation, give it a name and do a, a drawing of it, please, if you can. So one person of the group can just do a drawing maybe, and then you can just take a photo on your phone and, and try to post that into the Zoom. Um, or you can show us, um, when we go around, um, you can just use your phone to show us that picture. And you guys can be really creative here. It, does, it can be a bit crazy if you like. You can take different parts from different animals and stick them on like massive ears on a springbuck or something like that. It doesn't have to be super realistic. It just um, can be anything that you think. Like your animal wearing a furry jacket from pep stores because animals aren't gonna be able to buy clothes. So make sure it's natural materials, um, just natural adaptations, nothing from the human world, okay? No high tech stuff. Um, okay, and then one person in your group must just then quickly explain when you've finished um, how it works. Okay, I see there's some questions there. Who's that? Aman, what's your question? Uh, Aman, are you there? So, um, how much time are we going to do this? Vivek, are you with us? Do you have a question? Okay, guys, tell you what, if you've got questions, and I'm not seeing you, just write them into the chat, and then we can deal with them while you're in the group. All right, so... Um, Kogi, we need to divide into groups of three or four people. I think we've got we've got just under 40 participants here. So if we could I, be in group of three or four, that would be best. I, Tony, I've grouped them into groups of three and in some instances two. Uh, okay. So uh, shall I make it 20 minutes or 25? Yeah, can we make it 20 minutes, guys? Um, Let's see how it goes. We'll be coming around, joining your groups, checking how it's going and, and if you have any questions. But let's say try and finish this by 10.40. Okay, thanks, Tony. I see there's a question. No, you're not going to group yourself. So we've just to make things easier. I've already grouped you. So uh, it will take a few minutes on your screen. It will state that you are joining a breakout room. So you'll go in there and then after 20 minutes, the breakout room will close. You may not know the people in the breakout rooms. Please introduce yourselves and work together as a team. And then uh, my colleagues from the Sound Science Engagement team will come around and visit you and just check that everything's going well. Okay, so I'm now opening the breakout rooms and you will be, yes, you may pick any anima. That's correct. Yeah. Okay, so bye, enjoy your activity and we'll be coming around. Thanks. Okay. Guys, I've just... Uh, Corgi, I just wanted to ask which rooms should we join? Can I just join one that I don't see any of us in? Okay, uh, let me just one minute. I'll tell you how many rooms there are and then we can just divide them quickly. Okay, okay so cool. there's 26 rooms. So Belinda, if you can do the first three rooms, Caitlin, the next three. So Belinda, you'll do one, two, and three. Uh, 
Caitlin, you'll do the next three. So that's six. Cool. Uh, then Joe, the next three, which will be seven, eight, nine. Hi guys, um, I'm Caitlin. Um, so I'm going to be um, helping you guys through this a little bit. Um, cool. So do you want to go through and just introduce yourself? Because the three of you are going to be working together and just chatting about like where you want your animal to be from and what kind of things you can think of how you can make it better adapted to that environment. Morning, ma'am. My name is Camilo. Oh, nice to meet you. Oh, sorry. My dog has been demanding. No problem, ma'am. Um, Darren and um, Coco, um, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Cool. Do you guys want to just maybe say your name and maybe where you're from? I think that's a good place to start. My name is Dan Montiwa. Uh, sorry, uh, Coco, can you hear us? Can you hear my dog? <laughs> She's given me a ball and is being very demanding here. Okay, so the first thing that we need to do is that you guys need to do is come up with um, an area um, and describe how the climate is going to change here. So. Basic, I'll, what I'm going to do is I'll type it in the chat for you guys. So one is where. And it, oh, Mr. Bell, sorry, she's being very demanding. And my brother's still asleep. Um, he's very lazy. So where are you coming up with and what do you think is going to change? So how will it change? That's the first thing. The second thing that we need to do is we need to pick a species. So it can be, I don't know, what's your favorite animal or something like that. That's kind of found in that area that we we're thinking about. And then three is um, adaption. So how can it be better suited? Sorry, let me just go throw the ball for my brother. Um, will you guys start well, throw the ball for the dog and get my brother to distract the dog? Um, will you guys just start thinking about a way and a species that you can start that can be your 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 species for this little activity? I'll be back in two seconds. I'm sorry. Um, okay, so the third thing is that you need adaption. So how can it be better adapted to that environment? Oh, we lost a person. Um, better. Adaptions, how can it be, be better adapted? And then the fourth one is, okay, I like your Kruger Park option. That's cool. So 
yeah, take Kruger and think about some ways of how you think it might change. So um, the options that Tony gave you there were, um, will the summers be hotter? Will the, will the rainfall change? Will there be less rainfall or more rainfall? Um, start thinking about that. Um, number four is name. And then, okay, cool. Um, do the two of you guys want to just start chatting about these three, th these four things? So I see you're going to do Kruger and it's going to get a little bit drier and hotter. Cool. So now think of a species that's found there and then how it can adapt to these drier and hotter conditions. I'll come back now in a few minutes and check on you guys. I just need to check on a few of the other groups. Are you, are you good to go or do you have any other questions? And we're good to go. Cool. I'll see you just now. Um, what you can also do is you should be able to um, like call me or something or just ask for someone to come help you somewhere. I will. Okay. If you are stuck, you can raise your hand and I will come help you. Okay, ma'am. Cool. I'll be back just now. Good luck. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. All right, guys. So uh, thanks. Um, we probably could have used a bit more time, especially with the connection issues. It's quite hard. It's quite hard for you guys to work in a group like this. But can we just put up if your group did manage to finish? Can you put up your hand if you're the one who's going to report back to your group? And then I'll just select for you to speak. So just do the hand up thing if you're ready. Okay. All right. So I'm going to start with the first one on my screen, and that's a man party. A man, can you just unmute and then, if possible, show us the picture and just very quickly tell us about your your creature. Uh, yes, sir. So, okay. sir, um, um, our so I did a PowerPoint presentation here. So our animal uh, evolution. So the place I chose, chose our group chose was Durban. So okay. our uh, we're having changes in Durban. So what are the changes that we're getting in Durban? First is that the sea level is increasing. So the sea level um, in Durban is currently uh, um, excessively increasing there. Why? And that causes there to be less land. Then the third point is that it will have more rain. That area will have more rain and then number fourth is that it will flood that whole area will flood and then the number fifth one is that there's going to be less dry seasons and more wet seasons and then the sixth point we found out that it's going to have a really warm climate because we know that in order for rain we need moist air and then moist air uh, if there's moisture that means it's really warm in that area so yeah so these are the things we found out about the details <laughs> Now, okay. the law, uh, so the animal we chose is the aqua tragalopus strepsirus, which is also in a um, simple form, you can say the aqua kudu. So the animal we choose was kudu. So, and then we gave it some modifications and its adaptations. So the, okay. I'll first list it here and then I'll explain briefly what are these adaptations. So first we said that it's gonna be less weight um, and then we're gonna bring it to a small size it will have wings to swim, and then the skin is going to be thin and white. Legs should be flappy, the long tail, big lungs, and it's going to be omnivorous. Okay, so now let me explain briefly why we're taking this. So this is a really rough diagram of my kudu here. So I've given it that if this, it's going to be a small size, so automatically its weight will also decrease, and that will help it to swim ag and more agility. And, and it will have wings, 
um, the long tail and flappy legs. These three factors will help in, in order to swim. Because it's gonna flood in that area, we're expecting that this animal really needs to swim. So for a better swimming, we're giving his wings, long tail and flappy legs. And then we also expect that he's gonna be in the ocean and he needs food. So we're thinking we're gonna give him really big lungs. He's gonna also have gills and pores just like a fish's. So this will help him go if he wants food. So let's say if he wants reefs, so then he can go under the ocean and then he can hold his breath for a very long time and he can eat either the reef or let's say, for example, if there's not there, then he can also eat some uh, fish. So that, that's why we're giving it omnivores. And yeah, that is uh, usually um, the rounder point what we've given it. And then we've also given it that its skin is going to be thin and white. How that is gonna help is that it's, um, it's really hot in the area. So uh, because it's hot, I'm saying that and it's hot. So we're giving it, its skin is gonna be thin and it's gonna be white so that it's, it can reflect the heat. So it won't feel hot. So yeah, the scientific name we have given it is the Acrophaglifus strepsurus. Okay. All right, thanks very much. That's very good. Very creative of you guys. Thank you. Um, oh yeah, well done guys, that's very good. So there is, um, in the Okavango Delta in Botswana, there is a species of antelope that's it's kind of adapted to wet environments, but not nearly as, as much as your kudu. Um, you guys can look that up if you're interested. All right, thanks to that group. So just because time is short, let's move on. We can't really uh, have too many questions. Um, so next on my screen is Martha Banda. Martha, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Um, I didn't do the drawing, but my my colleague did the drawing. So I'll just go to the explaining and then I'll ask him to show the drawing. So the place that we chose is Kalahari Desert. So the there is hot conditions in the desert, which which is very not good to animals. So the the animal that we choose is a lion, but this lion will have wings. So it's hot during the day in a desert. So those wings will help the lion to cover itself so that it won't dehydrate much. So even at night when it's more cold, it will use the wings to cover itself so that it get moist. So for hunting as well, this lion can fly up in the sky to see, um, to be able to see much more much more animals so that it can hunt very well. Um, so that, so, sorry, so that it can hunt very well. So we have named this lion, Lion Eagle. So I would, Ashley, can you please show them the drawing please? Of the Lion Eagle that we... Hearing me. Ashley. Okay, we're just gonna send the, the picture in the in the chat. Okay, so that is our presentation. Thank you. Oh, there it is the, um, the lion eagle with the wings. So it can cover itself during the day when it's when it's hot so that it can absorb moisture and stuff so that it won't dehydrate much. And then during the day when it's that cold because temperature in a desert are really cold it to cover itself and then for hunting as well it can fly up high so that it will be able to see because it's rocky in the desert and this it's sandy as well so for running a lion won't be able to run that much so it will need the wings to fly so we named it lion eagle thank you okay well done guys that's very good very clever a little desert adapted lion. Um, Kogi, my internet is getting a bit unstable now. So if I'm suddenly not there, maybe if I don't respond at the end of a group, please just fill in for me. I did go out there for a second. 
Thanks. Okay. Okay. Thanks to that group. Well done, guys. And next up, I have Ms. Lali. Oh, hey guys. Um, my group and I, we chose a fish, um, fish from, so it survives in oceans that has warmer water that is colder in winter and hotter in summer. Right, the name of the fish is Gamiwe Africa, Gamiwe Africana. It's got thick, it's got thick shiny skin. It's got a shell, it's got legs. So this fish can survive outside the water. It's got a shell for protection and legs to come out of the water. And then it's got a, a thick shiny skin as well. It can digest plastic and it's got lungs to be able to breathe out outside the water. And it also produces enzymes to neutralize the plastic. So with the issue of water pollution, the fish can digest plastic using the enzymes that it produces itself, the PTase and the methase enzymes. Um, wisdom, can you please show them the, the drawing of the, of the dolphin fish? Yeah, yeah. Wisdom, bye. All right, thanks guys. That's very creative of you. Yeah, so that's scary is looking the, dolphin. <laughs> yeah, that's the Gamiwe Africana dolphin right there. So, wh where does Gamiwe come from? Um, it, it's from the Indian Ocean. Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, okay. Is it a place? Yes. I see. All right. Oh, well, I'd love to ask you some more questions about your creation, but um, you need to move on because of time. But thanks. Well done, guys. That's good. Nice ocean example. Okay. Um, let's move to the next group. Um, Vivek? Hello, sir. So I teamed up with Kalabohile. So she drew the Vantegris Kigras. So if she could show it, please. So the Vantegris Kigris has large ears, which provides an expansion surface, which are expansion surface area of exposed skin loaded with vessels and this results in greater circulation of warm blood from the body's core to the Pantagras cagris. And that protects it from the heat from the hot climate in the summer. So the area we've chosen is hot climate, very hot climate in summers and very cold climates in winters. And this play, and Vantagris Gris is in France because the, France has the same climate that we have chosen. So to protect it from the cold, it has very thick fur to protect against extremely cold conditions. So when it is in winter, the thin ears can be covered with fur around its neck, as you can see on the drawing. And the thick mm -hmm. fur will be removed like a skin from a snake when there is extremely hot climate. Mm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and until the fur will regrow as soon as it's winter. Can you show it again for a second, please? Um, okay, there we go. All right, nice guys. So you dealt with the uh, the seasonality issue, changing from hot to cold. Yeah. yeah. All right, so thank you guys. Um, okay. All right, let's move on to the next group. We've got a couple of groups still to to get some feedback from. Um, next up is Tanish, is that right? I'm pronouncing that. 
Hello, so yes, that's correct. Okay, all right, go ahead. Okay, so let me quickly just show my picture here. Um, it's giving me problems. Okay, so let me get to the explanations. Okay, okay. So, so the area we chose is the Sahara Desert. And in the Sahara Desert, we predicted as a group that um, it's going to get drier, and which means there'll be less water and it'll get warmer as well, which means the temperatures will increase. This means that there'll be um, less animals and less vegetation. And so animals that need to survive here need to store as much, as, store as much energy as possible. So the animal we chose is the lion. So we've, the name we've given it is the Saharan Desert Panthera Leo. So the adaptations we've given it are as follows. It'll have feathers <laughs> so that it can absorb or soak up water whenever it goes to a water body. And so it can use this water whenever it needs to. It'll have larger ears, which is a cooling mechanism. It'll have white skin on, um, on the underbelly, which will reflect the heat from the sand. It'll have um, humps, two humps, like a camel's which will store fat. And lastly, you'll also have um, able to estivate, which means it will slow its metabolism so that it can not lose as much energy in digesting food, which is quite a problem in, in, um, in the desert for such animals. Um, the other um, adaptation we've given it is that it can also concentrate its urine so that it can reuse the water not waste it um mike i cannot show you the picture at the moment because my phone is yes. our picture of the current panthera leo okay thanks thanks well done guys so that's a lot of adaptations you added on there It'd be nice to see the picture i don't think it would look like a lion much at all with all those changes but that's good very creative of you guys there's a lion Okay, uh, next up is Manaya. Oh, Finish, you got you. Okay, Good morning, go ahead. everyone. Uh, so, in my group, it was. Let me just quickly flip my phone. Okay. So, there's Happiness, Emela, Avo, and it's myself. And ours is the Mega Elephant. So everything, every feature of the elephant is enlarged like the ears are made bigger and the trunk is also made longer because as, as, you, as the elephant sucks the water, it will cool the water if it reaches. So like, like it's seen as a cooling mechanism as well. And we've also like hired like camel, the elephant. So it has a hump as well to store the fat. So because... The elephant is in a bushveld area, like because I we live next to the Kruger National Park, so I thought this was up there. So, but then it is dry season here, so we have a hump for the elephant to store nutrients when it doesn't have any water and stuff. And we all made the elephant skin gray; it's more a lighter color, like white or pinkish, so it reflects the light. And then also we have thicker hooves so when it walks, it's like not hot on the surface. And our more scientific name, uh, thanks to Amanda, is gigantic loxconda for like this purpose. And yes, that's basically our elephant. It's more, yeah, it's more like enlarged. That's why we made that. Yeah, thank you. All right. Okay, great. Thanks. Nice picture. Thanks, guys. A gigantic elephant. That's quite scary. All right. Um, let's see. We've got a couple more groups to go. 
Um, Bianca, are you there? Uh, Bianca, not there. Okay, let's try Salim. Hi, good morning. Uh, would you allow me to uh, share my screen, please? Okay, go, go, Salim. Should be sharing. Okay. So, uh, I name my animal the Arab dog, if you can see it. Okay. Uh, it's a unique name that I have came up with. Um, its fur is uh, using, um, it's a mammal, and its fur is warm, so it can keep it uh, uh, warm during the cold, and it stays in Antarctica. Its paws are padded so that ice, it can walk in the ice and its legs do not um, uh, get stuck inside the ice. So the tail is out of the dog, a dog tail, uh, simply because it's like warm for the animal and it can, you know, uh, keep it uh, walking straight and it's uh, balanced. Then the then the deer, we use the deer for the body simply so that it's it can stay warm. The fur is warm for the animal. We use the polar bear legs for the legs and a face and the face for the bear. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Salim. Well done. That's that's quite clever. Um, like the way you've taken ideas from different animals there. Okay, thanks. And then Bianca, are you back now? <clears throat> yeah. Um, the name of the animal is Kara. And the place you can find it in Cape Town. Cape Town is the place where the weather condition is normal cold. And it is, the animal is cold right? and it is white and can and as it wants. So, well, whenever it is, it is whatever, if, well, it is an And then it eats both plants and animals, including fish. And it gets into water to do and adapt, adapt to dealing with heat. Well, it's our drawing. Okay. Okay, you see it has these two wings of a bed. Then it's a bed. And then for when the when it flies, okay. when it flies busy looking for food, it can use that boost to eat. All right. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, you're breaking up a bit there, or maybe I was, but I think I got it. Where did the, the name Gara come from? Uh, okay. Okay, I think we've lost them, but thanks to that group. Well done, guys. Um, next one is Fidelia. Are you there, Fidelia? I think um, she. Hello. Yes. Hello. Okay. Um, okay. So um, the environment that I have chosen is the Sahara Desert. Okay. So currently in the Sahara, it's extremely hot. So um, the species that I have chosen is um, the Adex. So I did some research and it was said that the average rainfall currently in the Sahara is three inches or 75, 76 millimeter per year. So the climate change 
will affect it in a way that um, the increasing temperatures will lead to stronger evap evaporation over the sea. So due to increased evaporation, that means um, there will be more rainfall. So um, it might become that the Sahara Desert will become green. Yes, will become more green. Um, uh, so here's a picture or a drawing of the animal. So it's the adex. So I have made it to have um, a longer tail so that to keep bugs uh, to keep bugs away from disturbing it, and I have made a thicker coat for it to keep um, warm at night or when um, to keep warm at night when it's extremely cold. Um, bigger ears um, to to be able for it for them to be able to use to be used as umbrellas when it's raining since the increased evaporation will lead to more rainfall, to use them as ears. Longer legs covered in keratin. So keratin is um, the thingy, I don't know what's it called. Yeah, the thing that hooves, um, animals, anim animal hooves have, the material, it's made out of keratin. So why I've said the legs should be made out of keratin is for it to, not get affected by um, insect bite or not insect bites, snake bites, so that whenever it gets bitten by snakes, it will not affect it in an um, in a extremely way. And then the name that I have come up with is the um, evolutionary adex. Yeah, and that's it. Okay, thanks, Adelia. Well done there. It was a nice thinking outside the box, going beyond just temperature and thinking of other aspects of the environment. So you did some research there. Well done. Okay, next up, um, Buketso. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Koketso, and I am going to speak about the animal and meerkat. So... As the group, we chose the meerkat. So the meerkat is going to stay in the Kalahari where it is very, where it is very hot. So the average temperature that is found in the Kalahari is between 45 degrees Celsius and negative 15 degrees Celsius, which is very cold. So here are the things that we added to the meerkat. So firstly, the meerkat is going to have a bushy and long tail, which is going to work mainly for shade. The next thing is that, the next thing is that we're going to add big ears for, we're going to add big ears to it so that it can absorb heat. And the next thing is that we're going to add more fur to it so that it can keep warm at night because the temperature is going to be very cold. The next thing is that we are, the next thing is that we are going to add big paws to it so that it can dig deep down to protect itself from predators and also to get food. So the scientific name that we have chosen is the Catamalia. Now Mapifo is going to show you a picture of what we, of the animal we have created. Mapifo, could you please show us the picture? <laughs> oh, okay, nice artwork. <laughs> All right, well done, guys. Very good. All based on the meerkat. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Well done, that group. Okay, um, let's see who still needs to go. Um, we still have Milani. Yeah. Milani, have you gone yet? No. Okay, um, guys, um, um, what we're 
did um, we think of a, what was a, a worm? An, a worm. Um, the name of the swarm is aquaterrestrial. The reason we use the name aquaterrestrial because um, we want this worm in future to learn to live on, on water and on land also. So this worm in, in winter, oh, in winter, it will store fat that it gets on stuff that it eats. So, and it, it will keep it warm. And as we all know, the, the worm uses its skin for breathing and gases exchange and stuff. So um, we, as it will, it will develop gills. Oh, sorry. Before that, um, this worm lives in the Ant Antarctica. So um, with this global change and in, in, in stuff, um, the, the ice or snow will, will, will melt, making the Antarctica muddy and, and watery. So this worm will, will, grow, will grow gills so that it will land microscopic gills, so that it will land to, to breathe underwater. <laughs> And and um, this worm, and in summer, it will it will release um, this this fat as as a waste product, so that it will it won't be as warm as it was in winter. It will be cooler. Um, also, um, on win in winter, how will this? You may ask, how will this fat help it? keep warm. This fat will act as a coat that keeps the warmth of the, the worm not to, to penetrate out. So um, Mishali, will sh uh, my group member, will show you the picture of this worm. Mishali. Um, Sally, oh, thank you. There it is. Um, uh, um, the orange part represents the fat that inside, and the the dots um will represent the the gills or um yes the gills that it uses to to breathe and oh it also has lungs so that it will breathe outside the water. Um, and the the fact that it gets it gets it gets it for from the dead plants and animals that it eats. As you all know, that dead plants and, and animals are mostly found under what um, underground, and also the worm lives underground. So that's where that's why we said it it eats dead plants and animals. Thank you. Uh, so your mic is muted. Yes. Oh, um... Sorry. Okay. Sorry. I was just saying thanks to that group and um, well done for doing something different, uh, choosing a small creature that we don't normally think of. Okay. So next is Retabile. Retabile, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Yes. So my presentation is going to be about a bed. So the place I've chosen is the Amazon in Brazil, Northern America, where I'm going to choose a clim climate where the Amazon is going to be rain, cold, and longer winter days. The animal I'm going to choose is a bat. We're going to modify the bat that the bat's going to have camouflage and can see during the day, not like other bats that don't have the vision, they don't have to see other in days, and it's going to, have, it's going to be poisonous, and it's going to have fluffy and furry wings that don't get wet when, whenever it's rainy. The name of the bed that have modified, I'm gonna call it a Camilo bed. It's more pretty like a vampire, but it's not a vampire because its fangs are more poisonous 
and it can fly even if it's it's rainy, not like a bear that can fly when it's rainy and can hunt and it's an omnivore and it's immune to poison and its metabolism, it digests slowly because it's gonna live and it's gonna live in the Amazon and Amazon is always rainy. The Emma that I have drawn, the picture of the Emma that I've drawn is, that's the picture, thank you. Okay, thank you, thanks group. That was also something very different, nice and creative, quite a scary bird that. Yeah. So well done guys. Okay, um, who is that, Mashia Martle, is that right? Are you there? Yes, yes, that's correct. Okay, go ahead. So, okay, so in my group, we decided a village called, a town called uh, Tofimbaba in the Eastern Cape. Um, now, our animal will adapt to, to the, we made our animal adapt to the winter. So winters in Tofimbaba are short and are dry and are windy. So we made our animal um, omnivorous. So it eats plants and um, bugs, all sorts of things. And we have made it have a long tongue. Now this is a cold blooded uh, reptile. So we decided to give it fur for, so that it can be warm. And um, this lizard um, also uh, becomes prey to snakes. So we decided to give it um, wings so that it can fly to avoid snakes. And we also gave it claws so that it can dig well, so that it can find the bugs. Uh, we decided to name it the Verde Argama Gecko. So Verde means green in Portuguese. So I'm just gonna show you the picture right here. So this is our, I don't know if you can see it well. Okay, yeah, I can see it. Thanks, very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> scary looking gecko. Yeah. It's gonna be green. <laughs> so okay. it's green in a darker color, sorry. Okay, thanks, well done. Lots of adaptations there, all make sense. Okay, um, are there any other groups who are finished and, and need to give feedback? Um, uh, who is there? We've got life. Um, life, are you there? No. Oh, you are there. You need to unmute yourself. Okay, let me try someone else. We've got a couple of hands up still. Um, Jamasi, Monawe. No. Um, all right, guys. If you, I think we're going to have to call it a day now. We've gone way over time. Um, I'm a bit worried there's some groups who haven't been able to show us the creature yet. Um, but I'm not hearing from anyone. Write it into the chat quickly if you have something to present. Oh, okay. Jamasi, you're saying you're ready. But we can't hear you. So my group created a cat that would be suitable to the Kruger National Park. We named it the Bowler Cat because it has ears that are shaped like a bowler hat. The ears help it lose heat and also protect it from the sun. And it has large eyes that help it see things that are kilometers away and to also see in the dark. It has sharp claws to help it hunt and also dig holes to hide from the heat and a long tail to help its back get a long tail to hide its back from the heat. Yeah. 
and also some thick fur so that it doesn't get too warm. Thank you. All right, thanks. I like your name there. It's very original. Big ears. Okay, thanks, Jamasi. Uh, let's move on to Matome. Um, all right. Uh, so, like my animals from the Amazon. So, in the so like we named our fox the fox alope. So, what it does is it's a gathering <laughs> which adapts to the environment in a way that like it can survive cold nights and it can survive cold nights and like it's always energy it's always active Okay, thanks, Matomi, and your group. I'm just trying to read there on the picture what's happening on its neck there. Is that oh, thick? it's a it's a mane, the fur coat it's which can mane. absorb water. Okay. Okay, and it's in the Amazon. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Very majestic looking fox, foxalope. All right, thanks, uh, that group. And then next we have uh, Angel Maflago. Yes. Hi. Hi, go ahead. Okay, me and my group, I was with Zinzi and Liasha. And we were, represent, we were doing the, the cactus brand. Okay, let me start. Then the cactus brand is considered to be the largest type of brand in the US. In terms of size, it is closely similar to that of the spotted two way. Then the rain is characterized by having short rounded wings by the long rounded tail and long heavy bill. In terms of color, it is brown with white eyebrows. Then the bird normally feeds on the insects such as beetles, wasps, grasshoppers, and ants. Sometimes it also eats food and small frogs and, so, and some small reptiles. In general, this this, de these desert beds are distributed throughout the South African West Western desert. Unlike most rains, cactus rains can be normally found perched on top of the other shrubs and cacti, hence including their names and so forth. Basically, they do this to announce their presence. Then, Zinzi, can you please show them the drawing? Zinzi. Mm. Hi, guys. Um, this is our cactus friend. And, and I've also labeled it. This is a um, gray pill and shoot. A gray pill uses it to eat and fit to walk. And there's also a rust colored crown on its head. And it also has brown wings with light gray spots. And, and then I've also labeled the tail with white and broad bands. It also have buff colored breast feathers with dark brown spots. And I've also write a few notes about it. It says it will 
Okay, Zinzi, can I take it from here? In the protection of cactus plants, it lives in wild. Zinzi? And uses the rest as decoys. Female lays four to five buff, legs, buff eggs with brown speckles. Okay. Uh. Okay, can I continue? Yeah, carry yes. on. I think is giving, losing signal there. Yes. Okay, then the cactus rain forages for food on the ground, and also it might maybe use its long bill to turn over things on the ground, or maybe it ends, as I said earlier, with those grasshoppers who have fruits and seeds, and it's also adapted for life in the desert and gets most of the water it needs to survive for food that it eats. Hmm. Then uh, at all the hours, they utter a rose screechy noise that they sounds as if like they are starting the car. Maybe the cactus rains are always up to something uh, or it is weather hooping around the, the ground, feigning their tails as cooling their neighbors or singing from their tops of cacti. Uh, thank you. All right. Thanks, guys. That was very well researched. Sure, you guys did your homework there. Nice to interesting to hear from something from another part of the world. All right. I think that's all the groups. Um, I don't see anything else in the chat, but there's still a few hands. Um, is there anyone else who still needs to present? Uh, so I already presented. Um, our group was the Aqua Kudu. Yes. Um, I would, well, I was just um, listening. I got another idea. I just wanted to do if I can share it to you. Uh, okay, just hold on a second. Um, I see Obaki there. Obaki, do you still need to present? Where is Obaki? Morning. Morning. Um, me and my group, we have, we have chosen grassland. So um, in grassland, the su in summer, it got shorter and cooler. In winter, much colder, harsher and longer. Only rainfall in winter. Um, the, the animal that we have chosen is giraffe. It will look more like an American bison. Uh, it will develop a shorter neck, thick woolly coats to protect it from very cold temperatures in harsh winds. Um, it will also have a thicker skin with a layer of fat underneath to protect it from cold. Um, the animal will also eat, eat food for its metabolism. Um, we didn't have a picture, but our giraffe will become more like ox like. Um, the name of the giraffe will be Jerox. Thank you. Okay, thank you, guys. So, a giraffe that can handle cold. That's very good. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, we have another group there. Shihundla. I got the name right. Yeah. Uh, okay. The species, the name of the species that we have chosen is a black rhino. Uh, and the area we have chosen is Limpopo. We have chosen Limpopo as our area. The climate that we have chosen is warmer since rhinos like to play inside the uh, waters and it also like mud because mud protects their skin from strong suns. Um, and it enjoys the dry season, which is why we have also chosen a longer dry season and rainfall climate. Uh, this is the, the drone that I have made. It will be having scooters, scoot yeah. It will be having scooters. Mm -hmm. uh, to protect them more from, it will be having scooters which will protect them from 
uh, water laws. Yeah. And it will be called a rhino skewed. All right, thanks. So taking an idea from the reptiles, your rhino. Okay, thanks guys, well done. Um, I think we now finished all the groups. Uh, Aman, do you want to come back on? Give us your your other idea. Uh, yes, sir. Um, um, I didn't think, but after that, I thought of an idea which I thought was better for the animals. So we know that water plus carbon dioxide. Um, when the, we're assuming that the um, this water is the ocean water, because mm -hmm. after it's all flooded, there will be all the the ocean. So then there's carbon dioxide, which um, when it reacts with water, it gives carbonic acid. So this is due to all the industry waste and the car waste. Um, so they, they also give out carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide. So the ocean water, due to this reason, the ocean water can be more acidic. So what we want is that our aqua kudu will produce an alkaline solution to neutralize the acid for survival. So basically it will clean the water and it will be, um, even if the, um, the acid levels are changing, it will bring it back to normal and it will solve the problem. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that would be very useful if an animal could do that. It would certainly help a lot in the future because um, acidification of the oceans is a major issue. Very good adaptation, not just for that. Speech. Okay, thanks guys. Um, my internet's breaking up now, but um, I see we've modified the program because we've been over time by quite a lot. So um, we, one of the other sessions is gonna change, but my session is now finished. So I'm gonna say goodbye to everyone. Thanks for all your efforts this morning. It's very difficult to do this when you're just on cell phones. So well done for persevering and for making it work. And I hope you've learned something about animals around you. And next time you see wild animals, you'll think about uh, the adaptations and what they need to do to survive or how we need to help them survive if they can't adapt. Okay, so thanks. And I'm gonna hand over back now to, uh, who's gonna take over? Is it Corgi or? It's me. Ah, sorry, <laughs> Dile, okay, thanks. <laughs> Um, thank you so much, Tony, for that very interactive and wonderful activity. I think I speak for everyone on the Zoom call that we thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, for everyone, the learners, can you please take pictures of your amazing animals and send them to your WhatsApp groups? Will that be okay? Because they're so beautiful. I didn't know you guys had this creative. You didn't tell me. I think you have to teach me how your mind works with in terms of art and creativity and incorporating that with science. But um, well done to all of you. Please do send those pictures into your WhatsApp groups. But what we will do now, we will stretch our legs, we'll go to the bathroom, we will drink some water, and we will come back immediately at 12 p.m. Right, so we're just gonna take a little 10 minute break, just stretch, you know, go outside, breathe a little bit and come back in 10 minutes. You don't have to leave the Zoom call. You can just go do your thing and come back. And immediately at 12, we will do another amazing activity together. So I'll see you guys in 10 minutes. Oh, by the way, before I forget, I told you guys that there's an amazing prize to be won, right? I haven't forgotten. Maybe I should tell you what it is, a whole tablet. So today, if you participate and listen and learn as much as you can, there's an activity we're going to do at the end where you can win a whole tablet. How cool is that? But 10 minutes, we'll see you in 12, at 12 p.m.
Okay, I think so. Um, then we can go ahead and go straight into our next speaker, who is very, very knowledgeable with GIS and remote sensing. Um, and she got some excellent computer skills, which is very cool. Um, so, but currently she's a data scientist at Seon in Ulwad Node. But today she'll be helping us with some statistics. Um, so please pay attention. Um, I know that you've relaxed a bit during the break and your brain is ready to take some steps in. Learn as much as you can. Again, there's a tablet that will be worn at the end of this Zoom call. So thank you so much and over to you, Ralandeza. Thank you very much for that for that intro, Robotile. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, please allow me to share my screen. Yes. Okay. 
Uh, can everybody see it? Okay, it's doing the things. Yes, we can, thanks. Okay, thank you. So statistics. That's the title of my presentation today. And before we get started, I just need everybody to have some lined paper, a pencil, a ruler, and an eraser. Uh, hopefully everybody has all those items. Uh, if you need a, a minute to just gather them around, I'll give you a minute to go gather all those items we need for this presentation. So I'm giving you one minute. And then if you have them in hand already, could you please raise your hand in the chat so that I know that you already have all of them. Okay, cool. Seems like everybody has their tools in order. So, um, could you please raise your hand anytime you have a question? If you feel that, because I might not see the hands in time, just please stop me and ask the question at any point in the presentation. Before we get into the statistics of things, uh, we firstly have to define what data is and what information is. So, Data versus information. Data is an individual unit that contains raw materials which do not carry any specific meaning, while information is a group of data that collectively carries a logical meaning. That is to say, uh, 10, 15, 20, those are numbers. Those numbers can be referred to as data, but data of what? They do not have any meaning, but if I were to say 10 kilograms, 15 kilograms or 20 kilograms, me adding that unit or matrix to that number, no, you know that I'm talking about weight. If I were to say 10 centimeters, you know that I'm talking about length. So data doesn't depend on information, information depends on data. That is to say that data that does not relay any information to a person is very frivolous. So if you've got data such as the random numbers I mentioned, but they do not have any unit or contextual meaning, they're very useless because you don't know what they mean. Similarly, if I were, as you can see on my right hand screen over here, if I were to say sunny, rainy, windy, way, Weather is the atmospheric conditions of a place. So weather has to be related to a place in order for it to have meaning. And if I were to say, it was very windy, but what was my unit of measure? Hence, we, uh, we measure wind speed by kilometers an hour. Hence, we measure precipitation by millimeters. Another example that I have over here is money. So money, be it rent, be it euros, be it dollars, be it bula, be it loti, or be it yen. These are currencies of various countries. Uh, so various countries have various money systems. And for the mere fact that I said rent, you know which countries, which country that money relates to. So um, can anybody tell me which country uses the loti? Can you please say that again? Which country uses LOTI as a currency? LOTI, L-O-T-I. Anybody? Please suit. Thank you very much, Kingwell. Uh, they are like, I listed down six currencies. So the next one I want to know which country uses the yen. 
China. China. Sorry? China. Um, yes, China, that's right. No, it's China. And then, which country uses the Pula? Botswana. Botswana. That's Botswana. Correct. Yes, and then last but not least, I guess this is very obvious, which country uses the rand? South Africa. Oh, South Africa. 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 Thank you for that, everybody. <laughs> Yes, and then, uh, thank you for that, everybody. And then there's another one over here, location. Um, I have yes? a question. Okay. Um, if we say China's currency, isn't it renminbi? Is it yen Sorry? is for Japan, ma'am? Japanese yen not for China. Japanese yen. No, she, I mean, Chinese don't use yen. It's Japan who uses yen. That's good. I'm it's in two ways. Thing. It's in two yeah. ways. There's Chinese yang and there's also Japanese yang. And there's that other one for China that mean being whatever. There's, it's in two ways. Okay, then uh, mustn't it be specific? Like, because yeah, uh, we know it's a renambi. I knew Japan all of that. It's the Japanese yen. Those are the people who have always the yen. yen. Okay, uh, to my knowledge, I knew the Chinese Yang, but thank you for that. Uh, next time I'll try and uh, specify it more here. I don't want to be more specific to it because it would have given away the answer to the question. Uh -huh. So hence, I left it as just the Yang. But thank you for that. I'll note it down for the future. And then other forms of data, we've got location data. So in order for us to know location data, we generally have coordinate points which denote the position of an object in time and space. So those locations state the particular place of existence of an object. And then another one that I have over here is the rate. Uh, rate data gives us the cost of, of usage. So how much is a liter of petrol? That's the cost of usage. So currently we'll say petrol is 16 rand a liter. So that's a, a rate. Or if you're driving at a speed of 120 kilometers an hour, you travel a certain distance in 60 minutes. So that's rate. Um, any questions currently in this slide? Cool. So there are two types of data sets. We've got, okay. We've got discrete data and continuous data. Discrete data is defined as information that can only take certain values. And then below here, I have two examples that show you what I mean. Uh, these values don't have to be whole numbers, such as a shoe size of 3.5, but they are fixed values. A person cannot have a shoe size of 3.72. Like even they don't make shoes of size 3.72. And then another example is the number of children attending, the number of children attending a school each day. So that's discrete data. We can't have two and a half kids because people come in holes. So it, for that instance, it has to be whole numbers. And then discrete data is often represented using these below charts over here, which are tally charts, bar charts, or pie charts. These are used because they usually show categorical data. So hence they are used often for discrete data. And then on the other hand, continuous data is data that can take any value. And the best example for these are height, weight, temperature, and length. So continuous data can change over time, such as the weight of a baby in its first year of life or the temperature in a room throughout the day. It varies due to the atmospheric conditions changing on the outside. And then continuous data is usually 
visualized utilizing a line graph or a line chart over here because it shows the data, it shows how the data changes over time. And other continuous data, such as heights of a group of children, uh, can be show can be grouped and be shown as a bar chart. So each different color over here represents a different child, and then their length uh, represents the height of the kid. So these are grade ten learners, so they are grouped at five learners from grade ten and five learners from grade five. So that's it. Any questions on this slide? people um sorry miss can you say the definition for descriptive data again please okay discrete data is information that can only take certain values so it's 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 data that either has whole numbers or it's got certain set decimal points such as uh, people have to be whole numbers. Animals have to be whole numbers. Plants have to be whole numbers. But things such as shoe size, you can have a decimal point, but it's a, a set point. It's 2.5 or 3.5 because you cannot have a shoe size of 3.72. Yes, that's it. Any other questions? Cool. So it's time to play. It's a very short one minute game called discrete or continuous from the two explanations I just gave you guys. Um, is this data discrete or continuous? Raise your hand in the Zoom if you think the data is discrete. So please raise your hand if you think that the data is discrete. Is the data discrete? What's discrete? Yes. Discrete data is data that takes a certain value. Okay, Mom. Hmm? This is discrete data. If you think it's discrete data, please raise your hand. The number of chairs, is that discrete or continuous? Cool. Um, to all those who raised your hands in the chat, you are correct. Even though these chairs are different, even though they've got different shapes, different number of legs, a chair has to be a complete entity. We cannot have three and a quarter chairs. So here we've got two, four, six, eight chairs. This is a particular certain set number. So. To all of you who said that the data is discrete, you are correct. Next question, the mass of different meats. So over here, we've got different meats. If you put them on the scale, raise your hand if you think that the data that's gonna come out is discrete or continuous. If you think it's discrete, please raise your hand. Thank you. I see that nobody raised their hand and you are quite correct. This is continuous data. Uh, that's because the weight of those various meats will differ and they can take any value. So thank you everybody for participating. Now moving on. So statistics, what is it? Uh, statistics is a branch of mathematics that deals with the collection, organization, presentation, analysis, and the interpretation of numerical data to obtain useful and meaningful information. So this takes us back to the first slide. We use data to get information. So statisticians, people who do statistics, 
draw reliable conclusions about large groups and general events from observing the characteristics of small samples that represent only a small portion of the large population. What that basically means is that people who do statistics, statisticians, they look at this entire population through various methods. They select only a certain number of people from this whole population. In this instance, they selected four people. These four people will be part of the survey or will be part of the census. And whatever information is obtained from these four people will be used to make conclusions based on all of these people. So the feedback that these four people give will reflect what all of these people think. So why do people use samples, not the entire population? So sampling a portion of the population is number one, less costly and easier to do. So whereas sampling the entire population is flat out impossible at times, is very expensive and can be very difficult to do. So there are five stages of a statist statistical study and these include collection, organization, presentation, analysis, and interpretation. So the next slides will be focusing on these individual stages. St stage number one, which is collection of the data. Data can be gathered either from a primary source or obtained from a secondary source in various ways from different places. Uh, primary data are first-hand data collected, compiled, and published by organizations to serve some purpose, meaning that there is direct interaction between the subject, which is the sample group of focus grouping studied at the point, and the people who collect the data. And examples of these primary data collections are surveys, interviews, forms and questionnaires, and observations. And then we've got secondary data where the data are secondhand information that has already been collected, compiled, and presented by another organization or party. And this data is not a in its purest form because it has undergone some sort of analysis in order for it to be presented to the public. So examples of these data collection are financial reports, government reports, and internet reports. Uh, by financial reports, we could also use the GDP report as an example because it uses secondary data because it, it gathers its information from various sectors. So it collects information from the banks, it collects its information from revenue services, and it also collects information from government sectors. So that secondary data, those various sectors had their own primary data, which they correlated and put together. And then they used that data, gave it, gave it to the relevant people to correlate and create a GDP report. Does anybody that have any questions about primary and secondary data? Step two is the organization of the data. The data, yes. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you, uh, but I had a question, but it was about sampling. Um, yes. When we do like um, experiments, like at school and things, it so is a bigger sample size, does it give you more accurate statistics? Hmm, that's quite a tricky one. Um, I'd say yes, but there are people out there who could differ with me because if you've got a bigger sample size, it means that uh, you sampling a larger group of the population, meaning that you have various opinions and various feedbacks, which can then be related to the whole. So I believe that bigger sample sizes are better, but there are certain statistical processes that we go about to determine the types of 
sample sizes and the number of uh, our sample groups. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. That's very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, what does GDP gross? <laughs> the answer G is gross domestic product. Yes. Okay, so back to the organization of the data. Uh, the collected data is then organized in systematic order so that it can easily provide the required information at a single glance and be ready for the analysis which had to follow. This can be done by grouping the data, counting the number of occurrences of similar data and organizing the data in the tabular form as shown in the example below. This is an example from your last year's iNaturalist competition. So the data was organized. The data was organized according to the species. So over here, we've got the various species and this data was put in alphabetical order as you can see. So that's it. And then from that, we further counted the number of species which occurred within the iNaturalist competition last year. So this is what we got. We counted the we counted the number of species and then we got a hundred so from the, from this you can see at a single glance which species was observed the most during the naturalist competition and vice versa which species was least observed during that competition. And then this helps you organize the data in a hierarchy for the visualization, usually in ascending, descending, or alphabetical order. It aids with making comparisons between the data so you can easily see the most, the least, and the types of species which were, which were observed. And it also helps with the competition of calculations which are to follow during the analysis process. So presentation of the data is very important because it turns the data into meaningful graphics which convey some sort of information. So this could be presented as charts, graphs, and maps. These are all visual elements. So we visualize data so that it's easier to understand and to identify patterns, trends, and to spot outliers easily. So that we do not, uh, these things we do not normally notice if the data is in a spreadsheet or it, in its rawest form. So in order for us to present the data, we have to do some processes to the data. So we have to either group it, we have to find the mean, we have to find the max. So some process has to be done in order for the presentation of the data to be possible. So over here, we've got examples at the bottom. So from the previous table that I showed you, I presented the graph in a bubble plot. From the bubble plot, you can see that insects was the most observed because they've got the biggest circle, while mammals were the least observed because they are small. So we can use bubble plot, bar graphs, or pie charts. So from the insects that were uh, luckily for us at this point, it was 100, but usually um, you don't get observations which are 100. So we, we know that 39 insects that were observed lead to 39% of the entire data. And similarly, 18% of the arachnids which were observed lead to 18% of the data. So this is what the pie chart represents. And this bar graph over here, as I said, uh, they help us identify anomalies within our data. So these, this low temperature of a minus more than 60 degrees Celsius is, is, is wrong. So that shows that there must have been an error during data capturing process, also known as the data collection process. So if you find such within your data, you know that, no, I have to go back to that particular one, either 
use use uh, the rest of the data that I have available to get an average which I could use for this data or leave it out if it does not change the significance of my study. Since uh, it being here poses a, a very big problem for you since there's no way in South Africa that we had a low temperature of greater than negative 60 degrees Celsius. And then there are four things that you need to do when you're presenting your data to keep it, to keep it good looking. Keep the visuals simple. So like below, they simple, they straightforward, they convey the message. Use the data to tell a story. As you can tell from this, my story here is the number of species observed during an iNaturalist competition. So you can tell the story. It goes from the most to the least, most to the least, and then the various percentages each take. And then only use data that is important to your project. Since certain studies have so many data variables, you need to sit down and select which ones are important to you and which ones will be able to easily convey the message you want to tell and the story you want to tell. And then another thing is keep the colors to a minimum. As you can see, I kept the colors, it's a standard color palette, uh, because if you are to use way too many colors, it gets distracting to the eyes and then people cannot easily relate a certain color to a certain variable within your data set. So doing this makes it easy for people to relate certain colors to certain variables. But if you are to have too many colors, it distracts from what you are trying to convey. Any questions? I take the silence that we are all on the same page and that everybody understands what I'm saying so far. So moving on to the fourth stage, which is the analysis of the data stage. So at this stage of the statistical process, the data is often analyzed in terms of mean, mode, median, range, mean, max, and percentages. Uh, so in order for me to clearly explain the analysis of the data, I'm going to use an example. So a math teacher wanted to know how her learners performed in an exam and list their marks in the following way. So over here are the marks of 10 students listed by the math teacher. So in order for her to perform any analysis, she firstly organizes the data in descending order. So from highest to lowest. So here it is, she organized the data from highest to lowest. And then, so from this, she wants to know what the average of the class was, the average being the mean. So the, the mean is the average of the data. It's obtained from dividing the sum of the data by the sample size. That is to say, all the marks which the learners obtained are added together. And that gave us an amount of 307. That amount of 307 that we obtained, which is over here, we then divided by the number of learners which are in that class. So in that class, we had 10 learners. So 307 divided by 10 learners gives us an average of 30.7. So we rounded off to the nearest whole number, which is 31. So 31 is the mean for that class. And then from this, the teacher can interpret that five of her learners receive marks which are below the class average. So meaning that one, two, three, four, five, those five learners may need more attention. Those five learners may need extra lessons in order to get them above the class, class average or onto the same standard as everybody else. And then the teacher wants to know what the median is. So the median is the number in the middle in a sorted list of numbers. So over here at the top, my numbers are not sorted. So obtaining a median from this is not advice. A median has to be from a, uh, from a sorted list of numbers as is shown in by the numbers here in red. So, if there's an odd amount of numbers, the median is the the median is the number in the middle. So if there are 11 numbers, the number in the middle, which will be the sixth number, is the median. 
But for example, we've got an even amount of numbers. So the middle pair must be determined, which is added together and divided by two to find the median value. So for us, the middle pair, which is one, two, three, four, five, 32, and then one, two, three, four, five, 27. Oh, I made a mistake. So our middle pairs are 32 and 27. As you can tell, I made a mistake that most people do make. I used the middle values from the unsorted list of numbers, which is wrong. Do not do that. The correct way to do it is to look for the median in a sorted list of numbers. So 32 and 27 are my middle values. So we add those together. They give us a value of 59, not 45. So we add that together, it gives us 59. So we say 59 divided by two, it's gonna give us a value of 29.5, if I'm not mistaken. So from that value of 29.5, that's our median value. So we can round it off and have the median be 30. Uh, quick question, Bridget. Yes, that's, thank you. And then we continue the analysis of the data. So the mode. The mode is the value that appears most often in a data set, which makes it the number to most likely be sampled again. So in our data set, unfortunately, there is no mode. Each number appears only once. So the likelihood of each number appearing again is equal for all the numbers. And then the max, which is the maximum, is the highest number in the data. So the highest number, since it's in a sorted order, the highest number is very easy to identify, it's 50. There we go. Similar with the mean, which is the lowest number, it's very easy to identify, which is at the far right end of the data set, which is 30. And then finally, we have the range. And the range is the difference between the lowest and the highest values. So in order for us to get a range of a data set, we subtract the highest, the lowest from the highest value. So for us, it's 50 minus 13, which gives us a range of 37. And then during the analysis of the data, we can plot uh, histograms. So some histograms, these, these are six different types of how the histograms can come out. They can be uniform and symmetrical. They can be skewed to the right. They can be symmetrical. They can be skewed to the left. They can be bimodal and symmetrical or bimodal and skewed to the right. Um, what this histogram shows, it shows that there's no variation in the data. All the values are the same. Hence, it's uniform and symmetrical. And then this one is skewed to the right. It indicates that there are more high values than there are low values. The high values are usually positioned on the left-hand side. So the tail is towards the right. So hence, they say it's skewed to the right. The tail is towards the right-hand side, while the peak is on the right. So in the right skewed plot, the mean is always higher than the median. So you'll find that the mean is higher than the median. And then the left skewed plot is just the opposite of the right skewed plot. It indicates that there are more low values than there are high values. Hence, more low values are towards the right. And then the tail where the tail is towards the left. So in a left skewed plot, the median is always higher than the mean. Keep that in mind. And then symmetrical indicates that there are there are more low values than there are high values. Hmm. In a symmetrical plot, the median, the mean, and the mode are all the same. So that is to say the, the high values are those where the mean, the mode, and the median will be, while the low values are to the left and to the right of this plot, hence making it symmetrical. And then bimodal, it, mean, it just means that the data has two modes, meaning that two numbers which appear the most and it's symmetrically distributed. So 
the numbers to the left and to the right of the graph are identical. So it's a mirror image of one another. And then again, over here, bimodal means that we've got two modes, two numbers that appear the most within the data set. And it's skewed to the right means that they are more high values than they are low values in the data set. And then over here, we've got just the basic example. Uh, in which direction is our graph skewed? Anybody? Right skewed. Um, it is right skewed, ma'am. Yes. Skewed to the right. That's correct. And how could you tell that? What, what did you use? Because it's like going downwards towards the right. Okay, so it's going to the right. True. And then, as you can see from the graph, you can easily tell the maximum value, the range, the mean, the median, and the mean. As I said, for the, for right skewed, the mean is always higher than the median, while for left left skewed, it would be vice versa. And then the last stage is finally the interpretation of the data. So we look at the data to make conclusions based on patterns observed. We also able to relate the various variables to one another. At this stage, statisticians are also able to make predictions based on the various patterns and trends they observed in the data. That is to say, uh, the average mathematics mark for all grade 11 classes is 31 because that can be said from that one class where the teacher had an average of 31. So you, from this, that one class was a sample for all the grade 11 classes and all the, in the entire school. So hence I stated over here from the sample, you draw conclusions on the larger population. And then another one is the mathematics grade average is influenced by teaching time. So over here, you make inferences as to what resulted in the type of results you obtain. So from the data, you draw conclusions on what could have influenced it. You make relationships between the data you have at hand and other phenomena which may affect the data. So I hope you all have those tools we talked about at the beginning, because it's now time for a short 10 minute statistics activity. So below is a table containing the population data of South Africa for 45 years from 1975 to 2020. This data are rounded off to the nearest million. I'm giving you 10 minutes to create a graphical representation of the data, uh, provide basic analysis, which is the mean, the max, the min, the range, the mode, the median, I guess <laughs> the range, I mentioned the ties, that's an error please excuse me, as well as write a sentence interpre interpreting what the data means or what it's telling you. So I'm giving everybody 10 minutes to do that. When you're done with the activity, please raise your hand just in case we all finish before 10 minutes so that we can get feedback from a few people. Ten minutes, everybody. And then when you're done, please raise your hand just so that I know that who's that. I hope everybody can see the values in the table. Unfortunately, I can't zoom in, but uh, since we all have a pen and paper in hand, I can quickly say them for you. Uh, column one is year and column two is population in millions. For the years, these are the years that we have, 2020, 
1985. So that's one column. And then the population in millions is for 2020, we've got 59. For 1995, we've got 41. For 1975, we've got 25. For 1990, we've got 37. For 2015, we've got 55. For 2000, we've got 45. For 2010, we've got 51. 2005, we've got 48. 1980, we've got 29 and At Salim, uh, it could be any type of graph or any type of graphic visualization, anything that you want to do that can visualize the information that's on the table. Sorry? We have six minutes left, six minutes, everybody.
Carla Lezan, we have a hand up. Um, my uh, let's wait for a few more hands. You've got four minutes, guys. Or is it a question? Uh, by show of hands, please raise your hands if you are done. No hands are up as yet. Uh, guys, we have three minutes, three minutes to be done with the activity. Cool, guys, our time is up. 
So that was 10 minutes. Uh, do I have any volunteer who wants to share with us what they've done? Yes, sir. Um, yes, ma'am, I can start. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, you can share your screen. Okay, ma'am. So, um, uh, all right. So first, um, let me just tell you the values of the mean and then I'll go to the graph. So let me start with the mean. The mean I got is 42.3. And mm -hmm. the max is 59. It is all a million. Uh, mi uh, the minimum is 25, uh, 20, 25, 25. And then the range is 34. The mode, there is no mode as there's no repetition. And then the median is 43. These are the numbers that I got here. Yeah. And then the bar graph I got, let me just share a little bit. So this is the bar graph where um, I actually did first in, in five, tens, 15, 20s. And then I just inserted the numbers. These are all in millions, these figures. And these, all these years are in five, in five, five years, there's the difference as it's 1975, 1980 onwards till 2020. So this was my observation and then I made it off of my order. And then, yeah, and then at the end, the you asked for interpretation and then I got is that the average increase in five years is <laughs> except uh, when it's 2000 and 2005, it is 3 million. Yes. Thank you. Thank all you right. very much for that. And then uh, Vivek, you also had your hand up. Yes, ma'am. Uh, let me share it with you. So, so I got my bar graph like this. So on the on this side, I have a population in millions and I got the time in years. So I went from 1975 to 2000. And on, on this side, I got, I went in threes from zero to 60. And every time it was going, it was increasing. So, so for the mean, I got 42.3 million and for the maximum, I got 59 million. And for the minimum, I got 25 million. And for the range, I got 34 million. For the mode, there was no mode. And for the medium, I got 40 because there wasn't, there was two odd numbers. So I plus 39 and 41, then I got 80. Then I divided by two, then I got 40. So then I said in 1975, there was only 25 million people, but it slowly increased each five years. And until 2020, it reached at the highest of 59 million. Thank you for that, Vivek. Um, any more hands or can we move on? Anybody else wants to share? Yes, Father, your hand is up next. Okay, so here's what I did. Um, I'm not sure which button should I press. Okay, so. Um, I need to turn this thing at the back, but I don't know how to do it, the camera. I also don't know, uh, Caitlin, can you help us? Maybe you can find it next to the volume button on the top left corner. Um, if you can't mm -hmm. find anything, okay. um, just Turn your phone around. I know that's going to sound really weird, but just show that the camera is facing what you want to show us. I know it might be a little bit awkward, but it might work.
Okay, so. Uh, okay, so this is my graph. It's not really nice, but I'm sure you guys can see it. Are you guys hearing me now? Yes, we can hear you. And you can see my video as well? Yes. Okay, so I've, the mean I found um, 423 and then I divided by the, by the total number of the stuff, which is 10, and then I got 42,3 million. And the maximum is 59. The mean is 29. So the range, I was like 59 minus 29, then I got 30 million. So my graph was starting from, I put the years on the y, on the x axis and the population of millions of in millions on the x axis. So I did it as 10, as in tens. So this is how my graph is going on. So the, the numbers just increased from each and every five years, like from 1975 to 2000. That's how the thing was going on. Okay. And yeah, yeah. um, thank you very much for that, Martha. I see there are plenty more hands that are up, guys, but um, time, time is not our side, but please can you take pictures of your answers and responses and send them to your WhatsApp groups because I'd like to see what everybody came up with and if our answers are correct. So please do that guys. Um, I'm so sorry that I can't, I can't get everybody to share their answers. So um, moving on. This was my answer. So it's basically, uh, I got 42.6 for the mean. Uh, the max is the same as everybody else. Uh, the mean is 25, the range was 34 and there was no mode. And then the me my median was 43. I decided to utilize a line graph to show this data because line graphs represent time series data very uh, very nicely for lack of a better word. And then what I'm glad and what I saw is that I could hear that you were indicating the unit of measure stating that it's population in millions everywhere you went uh, because that's given marks during the exam and also be sure to label your axis as well as your graph, give your graph a heading. And then my interpretation was that the population of South Africa will increase by another 4 million people uh, in South, uh, by another 4 million people by 2025, as has been shown by the trend here from 1975, we got 25, we moved to 29, that's four. From 29, we moved to 33, that's another 4 million and so on and so forth. So my interpretation was that in the next five years, you'll have an increase of at least 4 million at minimum. So it can be above, but minimum will be at least 4 million. And then moving on. So there are two types of statistics. So two branches of statistics. One is descriptive statistics and the other is inferential statistics. So as it says, descriptive st st statistics are used to describe the basic features of the data in a study. So the descriptive statistics mostly focus on central tendency, which means the way in which quantitative data tends to cluster around some value. The, the central tendencies are what we just did, uh, the means, the medians, and the mode. Uh, variability, which refers to how much difference there is among the elements which uh, an example can be the range of the data and then the distribution of the data. So the distribution refers to the shape and direction of the data. So the skewness, it goes back to that right skewed, left skewed, bimodal um, uh, graphs that I showed you earlier on. So this, Descriptive statistics provide summaries about the sample 
and the measures. So hence, we've got the mean, the mode, the range, those are all descriptive elements. And then we've got inferential statistics. Uh, you are trying to reach a conclusion that ex extend beyond the immediate data alone. So you infer uh, on what the data is trying to tell you. So I used to make generalizations about large groups. So when you have collected data from a sample, you can use inferential statistics to understand the larger population from which the sample is taken. So inferential statistics have two main uses, one being they make estimates about populations. And then an example is the mean metric results for all metric regions in the country. You infer, you infer what the mean is from just the sample population. And then uh, you test hypothesis to draw conclusions about populations. Uh, again, using the metric results and it's, as an example, you test the relationship between family income and the results of a metric student in a particular year. So you infer on what could have caused the data to be what it is. You try and make connections between the various relationships which may exist. Um, can everybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, okay. we can. Yes, we can. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry, I just got a chat that said I'm not audible. So thank you all for responding. And then we're coming to an end, guys. I hope that you understand descriptive versus inferen inferential statistics uh, because I just want us to play a very short game. It's called descriptive or inferential. So for this one, I'm going to have my eyes on the chat screen. So whoever raises their hand first when I ask is the one who will be allowed to respond. Can you please not scream out the answers so that we have some sort of order? So statement number one, the average prices of a house in South Africa is that Descriptive or inferential, Aman? Uh, Darren, you next. The average prices of a house in South Africa, is that descriptive or inferential statistics? Inferential? Um, Ma'am, I think it's descriptive because this is the mean, and then the mean usually goes into descriptive information statistics. That's true, Martha, thank you. Um, moving on to number two, the effects of COVID-19 on the global death rate, is that inferential or descriptive? The Deidre, I think, Deidre. I'm sorry for pronouncing your name wrong, but could you please give me the answer for that? Um, I'll say it's inferential statistics. Why? Because it keeps changing. It ain't like a constant number. Okay, that's correct. It is inferential statistics, but that's because we're relating the uh, effects of COVID-19 to the death rate. So we want to know if uh, COVID-19 is increasing or decreasing the number of people who are dying. So that's correct. Uh, the number of shoppers who visited the Mall of Africa in the past 30 days. Is that inferential or descriptive? Uh, Mishali? It's inferential. Um, um, no, it's actually descriptive because that number was recorded. So it's, a, it's the max, it's the maximum value that was observed for that day. So the number of shoppers who visited the Mall of Africa in the past 30 days is descriptive since it's it's a max value. Uh, number four, determining the relationship between the rate of unemployment and education level. Um, let's go, beauty. Descriptive. Could you say it again? Descriptive. 
descriptive. Oh, unfortunately, that's not it. It's inferential uh, because determining the relationship between the rate of unemployment and, educa and education level, it's making inference from one data set to another data set. And then number five, a store manager analyzes the effect of TV ads on the types of goods that consumers buy. What type of statistics is that? Um, how do you pronounce Vudhari, Mr. Nyat? Nyat, could you please? It's inferential. That's correct. Number five is inferential. And then number six, Johannesburg is the city with the highest crime rate in the country. <laughs> Happiness, do you want to take a shot at number six? It's yes. inferential statistics. Uh, unfortunately, that's not it. Uh, since highest crime rate in the country. Highest, uh, we observed all... We observe the percentages of crime in all cities in the country, yeah, right. and then found oh, that Joburg had the highest. So that's descriptive. It's the maximum crime rate for cities within South Africa. So it's a descriptive value. And then number seven, last and final one, majority of the first year students are 19 year old. Um, who, could you please answer the last one for us? Ma'am, it's descriptive because that, this is, ma'am, because the amount of 19 year olds that appeared is a mode from the data that was collected. So it's descriptive, therefore it's descriptive. Thank you very much, that's correct. And then that brings me to the end of the presentation. So. Thank you all for your time and your attention. Uh, before I close it off, are there any questions related to the presentation? Is there something that anybody needs clarity on? I'll take that silence as a no. So once again, thank you everybody for your time. And I hope you really enjoy this activity since it was a pleasure for me to present it to you guys. So enjoy the rest of the science week, guys. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, Khalilitang. Thank you very much. Um, I hope that. they ask you to do some statistics you will also help your classmates that didn't make it today um, but thank you so very much for that I know that it was very helpful um, for now our very last activity which I know you've been looking forward to because at the end of it one of you will go home with a tablet um, so without wasting any more time um, Caitlin will come and we'll do a Kahoot um, quiz together. And the quiz is based on everything that we've learned here today. So I hope you're ready and that you will enjoy it as much as you, we would all want to win the tablet, but it's about learning also. We're all going to get something out of it. So please um, participate and have fun while doing it. Caitlin. Yeah, uh, thanks, Rebel. Um, cool, guys. So this is our last thing for today. So we are, um, yeah, it's just to check how much you were listening. And there's a nice little prize at the end for you, um, as Rebel said. So what I'm going to do now is I've just posted stuff in the chat. So you need to visit um, kahoot.it and um, you're gonna enter that game code that's there. So what I'm going to do just to help with all your bandwidth and everything so the internet works okay, I'm gonna turn my camera off and I'll ask that everybody turns their camera off. Um, just, it will help with those people that are struggling um, with internet and stuff. Um, yes, yeah, sure. If, I would say people can participate, but you won't win a prize. Um, just maybe add Sasta to your name so I won't 
call it out in the in the things. So um, yeah. So the idea here is that you're going to visit Kahoot IT. You're going to add in that game pin. And will you please just um, use your real name, not a nickname, so we can figure out who you are, so we can get a prize to you. Um, so yeah. Uh, okay, my camera's off. I'm just gonna check how other people's cameras are doing. What I would like for you guys to do, if anybody is struggling, um, will you come back here um, to the Zoom side and just ask your question? I can see how many people are have already um, entered our Kahoot's quiz. So cool. Those of you are struggling with the game pin um, and you've got to kahoot.it, it's 903963 that you need to type in. Just because I know like copying and stuff can be a little bit awkward sometimes. Um, cool. So we have nine people so far. So we still need a lot more people to come through. So once we're all on Kahoot's, this quiz it won't be too long. Um, and then, yeah, cool. I will send the links again. Um, let me see if I can make it that that is a hyperlink, that it will actually work. Oh, being weird. Let's try this. That you can just click on it because that's easier. There we go, cool. Um, so yeah, you can just click on this um, link there that's in blue and it should take you there. And the game pin is 903963. Um, Amana, see you have a hand up. Is that from earlier or do you have a problem? And happiness, are you guys good? Okay, I can see happiness is no, no, in. It's fine now. Um, I just, um, it was just for answer, but it's fine now. I'm um, sorted out. Okay, cool. Oh, we've got lots of people coming in thick and fast now. We're up to 20 something. So let's just give the rest of the people a little bit of a chance um, to come in. Yeah. Can you please give the link again? Cool. He has the link and then I'll post the game pin as well, but I'll call out the game pin um, for you because it's easier. Um, okay, cool. So you click on that link and you go to the, the place where it says game pin and you're gonna enter 903963. And then you add a nickname, but um, just make sure it's like kind of like your normal name not too much of a far-fetched so we can figure out who you are and yeah if anyone from Sasto or anyone does want to join you can join but just add like something to your nickname so I know that you're not part of it part of the kids so you don't win our prize and um, you can just say like Sasto in brackets at the end or something just so just for us to know Cool, we're on 41 people. Let's just wait for a few more because I see there's 66 people in our, um, that are part of the Zoom call, just so everybody gets a chance. Um, I'm gonna post the links once more. Cool. Okay, so anyone who's still stuck with the game pin, it's 903963. Cool, so this um, little quiz is just a way for us, like a fun way for us to check that you guys were listening and um, yeah, it's uh, to give you just something to look forward to, for, look forward to. and it's, it's always cool to win something. Um, cool. Well, we're down to 40 people. I think someone must have had an issue with their connectivity. 
Okay, 44 now. Okay, we, we're jumping between 44 and 45 people. I think there's connectivity issues. Um, yes? Yes, I'm still having some connective, connectivity yeah. issues, so. Does it kick you out of the Kahoot thing? Um, I think everybody's turned off their cameras and stuff on Zoom, which should which should be able to help. Um, is there any place, do you know if there's somewhere where the signal is a little bit better in your house? Um, I would try try just see if there's anywhere nearby, like in your house with where the signal is a bit better. Okay, we have um, 46 people right now. Um, anybody else having connectivity issues? Um, Okay, cool. Um, let me just see, is there anyone who's still struggling to log on to the Kahoots thing? Because um, I know there are a few people here who are just observing and stuff. So if we count all of those in, there's maybe about five people who haven't joined in. Joined in. I'll resend the link. Um, I haven't started the quiz yet. I'm waiting for everybody to come and join um, just so we all have an equal chance. And yeah, so basically how Kahoot works is um, I've given you guys there's 10 questions based on the things that you've learned today. And you get scored based on how fast you answer it, but also if you get it correct. So you want to be as quick as you can be but you also need to make sure that um, you get things right. So fast, but make sure you know what you're saying. Cool, we're on 46 people. I'm gonna give it, um, let's say one more minute. If anybody is having issues, please come back to, to Zoom and let me know. You can say something in the chat. Um, I just don't want to spend like another, I don't want to waste too much of your time, um, but I still want to give everybody a chance to join. So yeah, one more minute and I think we can start. Or if you are having issues, please come back to Zoom and let me know. Ah, we're up to 50 people now. <laughs> okay, cool. So um, how I've set this out is that there are two questions in the beginning that don't count for any um, points. So they just, so you can get used to cahoots, how it works and stuff like that. Um, just so you're not at a disadvantage if you haven't um, used it before. And then from there, I'll let you know when the real questions start um, and we'll go, go through it. It's quite nice because what it does is it tells you the question and then it gives you four options of multiple choices for the answers. 
Um, cool. I think we are all ready, all good to go. I'm going to start the quiz. Okay. So. Our first question here is what is your favorite color? So you just need to click on the block or the color block at the bottom of which one you pick. So you can see there's a timer and it counts down um, to the time. So I've set times for each of them. Um, so the fairly simple questions, you'll have 20 seconds, but there's a few questions where um, you need to work out things and stuff where you have a little bit more time. So we can check if you were listening. Cool. Lots of people like blue. Blue is also my favorite color. Okay. Next question. This one's also a trial round. How many terrestrial biomes are there in, in South Africa? Cool. Okay, so there are nine. I think a few of you have said eight. There's one weird one on like the east coast of the country that a lot of people forget about called the Indian Ocean Coast Belt. Okay, next one. Are we all ready for the um, Sorry, let me just mute someone there that you don't have to do it. Okay, cool. Are we all ready for the rounds that actually count? Okay, let's go. So this question is, in humans, sweating is a way of dealing with what? Cool, most of you got it right. Yeah, Tony um, spoke about it earlier, how it's a way that you can keep yourself cool um, in dealing with the heat. Okay, next question. Which, which is a behavioral adaptation to heat? Cool, well done, most of you got that right. Yeah, going underground and hiding away from the really hot, well, during the hot times of the day. It's a nice way to change your behavior to deal with the heat. Okay, which is not a behavioral adaptation to aridity? Um, cool, yeah, basking in the sun. That doesn't really help with when it's an arid place. It helps to warm up. It doesn't help you with saving water. Um, just to make it clear that you need to just click on those colored blocks at the bottom um, to answer the questions. I just saw a thing in the chat now. Um, cool, next question. Having large ears is an adaption to Yep, most of you got that right again. Well then, yeah, we spoke about it earlier, how it's a way of cooling yourself um, and an adaption to heat. Okay, our fifth question is, um, which is an example of discrete data? 
you got to think more on the stat, stat side than the animal and adaption side. Cool, yeah, shoe size was the discrete data because it's like a group of things. There's, you don't get like middle shoe sizes. You, they like specific things, not like a continuous data set of shoe sizes. Okay, let's have a look at what our leaderboard's going, looking like. So we're basically halfway. We've got five more questions left. So we have Tanesh in first place with a little bit of a lead over Camogelo. And then we have Pat in third place um, with a little bit of a lead. I mean, with, with about a hundred points below, behind. So our top three people right now are very, very close. Um, okay, next question. Which graph represents continuous data here? Cool, yeah, the line graph is a nice way to show um, continuous data and scatter plots and stuff, those kind of ones. Um, all the rest are kind of grouped into different categories. Okay. Our top three are still the same, but we've had a swap in our second and third positions. Okay, next question. In which direction is this graph skewed? Okay, yeah, like most of you, I would call this symmetrical because both of the sides look fairly similar. Um, yeah, it would have been nice if I gave you the mode and median and stuff. So, I mean, the mean and median and things so you could actually see like using um, the descriptive stats as well. Okay, next question. Calculate the mean number of iNaturalist observations. So this one here, you have a little bit longer. You have a minute to answer this question. Hi, Corgi. Um, okay, so we have that answer there. So there are, um, it, all those things added up to 111 and there were six different groups. And when you divide 111 by six, you get um, 18 and a half. Cool. So we now have two questions left and um, uh, right now we have Tanishk in the lead. We have Pat coming second. It's quite a while, quite a while, um, a few back. Um, so Tanishk has quite a nice lead. So Pat and um, we've got Milani in third, who, so second and third are quite close. So if you guys are quick and get the next few answers um, correct, you might get Tanishk a run for his money. 
Okay, next question. Identify the mode in the following data set of iNaturalist observations. Okay, cool. So yeah, the mode here is three because there were, um, I think two threes in that data set and only one of all the other numbers. Um, so we still have Tanesh in the lead, um, but Milani and Pat have swapped around. So we now have Milani in second and Pat in third place. Cool, last question, are we all ready? Select the best, the best definition of evolution. Cool, yeah. So it was the blue one where it changes in species over time due to like selection of like little variations that are advantage or advantageous or like are a bit better. Cool. So let's have a look at our scoreboard. So in third place, we have Vinaya. Oh, you came from behind at the end quite fast. In second place, we have Michlani, yeah. And in first place, we have Tanesh. So, oh, Pat and Milani, I see you guys just missed out. So um, congratulations, Tanesh. We will organize with um, Joe and Corgi to get a tablet to you. Um, so yeah. Thank you guys very much for playing in our quiz. Um, I think, can we all go back to the Zoom call and we can just um, finish things off? Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much, Caitlin, for facilitating the quiz. Congratulations to Tanish. As Caitlin mentioned, uh, you will get the tablet and the bird app uh, that will be on the tablet. It's the Robert's Bird app. So well done to you. Uh, a big thank you to all our facilitators, Dr. Tony Swimmer, for an um, engaging and exciting activity. I'm sure you all enjoyed it. Thank you to all our learners for participating in today's program. You participated really well, both on, um, on all our activities. Your enthusiasm is um, much appreciated. A big thank you to Galat Singh for her presentation on stats. Uh, you all enjoyed that, and we saw some lovely graphs coming out from that presentation, so well done. And thank you again to uh, everybody else from the Seon Science Engagement Team and Seon staff members that enabled this uh, program to be a success today. I'm sure all of us can attest that it was an enjoyable and beneficial program, and we all learned a lot from this. I would also like to thank our partners that made this possible. That is the Department of Science and Innovation and SASTA that assisted us in making this program possible for National Science Week. So before you leave learners, there are two things that we need you to please assist with in the next five to 10 minutes. I have put a link in the chat. It's for an evaluation form. And Caitlin's also put a link in the chat 
So this time round, learners, there are two evaluation forms that you need to complete. So we kindly ask you to complete both those evaluation forms because without those, uh, we are not going to be happy. We need to account to our principals what has happened here today. And it's only through those evaluation forms that we can account for the program that took place here. So we'd like to hear from you what you thought about this program and how we can then improve this program. So Caitlin posted the link and I've also reposted the links. So please complete that. We're going to give you eight minutes to do that. Once you're done, just raise your hands so that we know that you are done. Thank you very, very much. And then a big thank you to Rebotile. She was our program director. She did an awesome job. And thank you so much. She made sure all your questions were answered when you raised your hands and so on. So we thank you, Rebotila, for making everybody feel comfortable and doing a wonderful job with uh, directing the program. Shlali, are you done? Yeah, I'm done. Okay, great. You did both the evaluation forms. No, I did one. Oh, there's two links there. One link from Caitlin and one link from Seon team. Can you do both? Okay. Benea, have you done both? Uh, no, I'll, I'll do the second one now, just now. Yeah, please. And also, thank you for helping us. Joe mentioned that you helped him a lot with getting the learners on board. So thank you. Oh, it's my you. pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. It's my, it's my pleasure. Okay, so please do both. Thank you. Vivek, are you done with both the evaluation forms? Yes, ma'am. Okay, great. Thank you so much. You may enjoy your long weekend, and thanks for joining us. Thank you, ma'am. Mishlali, are you done with both?
Not yet, ma'am. Okay, thanks. Thank you so much, Imelda. You may leave the call, take care and enjoy your weekend. Gift, are you done with both those evaluation forms? Vivek, you may leave once you have done both. <laughs>